and we're ready-ish, and we're live, and it's Tim. Good friend Tim. Say hello, Tim. Welcome back. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me again. Having you again. You're basically having your way with us. That's what you're doing. You're bringing us on this Ironborn slash Euron reread, and we're happy to we're happy to let you play program director here temporarily on the Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire program. So welcome, everyone. This is yet another exciting chapter read-along where we dissect George Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire line by line. We thank you for tuning in. Um, you can expect to find analysis of the chapter and the plot as well as a symbolism, foreshadowing of the endgame, rear shadowing of the long night mysteries. Where we'll take apart all that stuff. We'll definitely comment on anything sexual, remotely sexual. We'll make a big deal out of it, I promise. Uh, this is the chapter where Euron exposes himself to Vic, so we'll have uh, a little dark fun with that. Uh, oh, that sounded bad. Okay, so <laughs> no no dark fun. No naughty Euron jungle of love. Okay, so here we are. This is what you can expect. And if you want to support the program, you can pipe up with a super chat, which is right inside YouTube function, or you can use the PayPal link, paypal.me slash mythicalastronomy. That's in the description below the video. Do appreciate those donations, and you can attach a question to that if you want as well. And I will check those periodically throughout the stream. So, Tim, a week ago, you joined me and we read the King's Moot chapter, also known as the chapter where Euron sounds the mighty dragon binder. Only about, this is like one tenth to scale. <laughs> dragon binder's <laughs> like eight feet tall. So, um, then during the week, Tim, while you were going, oh, no, she'll hold up your horn. I didn't see it. No, I, there you go. Yeah. Now we're all feeling horny. And so during the week, we read the chapter at the wall where Melisandre burns the fake horn of Jorman, which looks a lot like Dragon Binder. Instead of mm -hmm. Valerian steel bands, it has bands of old gold. Instead of Valerian glyphs, it has runes of the first men inscribed on it. Uh, but other than that, it's the same black, eight feet tall, twisted. And Melisandre burns it, which is somewhat comparable to the idea that the horn, when it was blown, it lit up on fire. So the language is similar with the horn burning in the pit. Um, it seemed where it was green fire, Tim, which suggests Mel, Mel was probably using wildfire. But she also has powders to turn her flames different colors. She also uses glamours. So uncertain what exactly was going on in that chapter and actually a commenter tim and i want to get your thoughts on this burning of the horn scene a commenter suggested that maybe that was somewhat illusion the horn didn't burn and that that thing is still at the wall because melisandre wouldn't just burn a relic that has potential magic power so what were your mm. thoughts on that and the, the the burning of the scene the fact the, the two horns look so similar take yeah, that anywhere you want well, I do like the idea that maybe these are the both of these horns are from the same pair uh, because dragons would have two horns. They're not unicorns. Um, but the distance between one, it, that becomes a question that of how does one end up, end up one end up in Valyria and the other end up in the north uh, if they both came from the same dragon. But it, it is a nice thought that they both come from the same. Well, dragon. there is that fellow Azor High, Tim, who seems to yeah. get around a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know. Yeah, someone who can travel really far, really fast. Is, doesn't that sound familiar? Uh, you're on. Um, but I guess um, I guess what the question is, like, maybe it wasn't wouldn't burn, but also couldn't burn. If dragons are fire made flesh, then it seems likely that some that a bot that a piece of them, especially something like a horn, which would be a more a, def a defensive appendage, maybe it just couldn't burn. And the green flames is just is is what naturally occurred from it, like just in, in from this un, in, inability to burn it. Yeah, a horn you could blacken and singe it, but you can't really. It's not really flammable per mm -hmm. se. I mean, if you threw it in the pit with kindling, you could there'd be a fire all around it. Maybe you could get the fire hot enough to destroy the horn. I'm not saying you couldn't. But Tim, yeah, you raise a good point. Dragons, everything on dragons is meant to be flame retardant. Their scales, their claws. The only vulnerable part is the eyes, which is why you see the dragons go for each other's eyes sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
yeah, I, I, I don't think dragon's horns would burn easily. Now, we don't know that that's a dragon horn, but it kind of has to be, doesn't it? Eight feet long? Like John says, if this is the horn of an aurochs, it's the largest aurochs that ever lived, which is an easy way of George sort of pointing out, be like, so look, guys, an aurochs is a shaggy bull. They're they're extinct now, but it's basically just a hairy bull, kind of like in the bison family. They're big, but Tim, I don't think their horns are eight feet long. No, no, absolutely not. Unless, like you said, it would, ju- it would have to be the biggest aurochs in existence to even come close. Like Babe the Blue aurochs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It would have. Yeah, that would. This would need to be Paul Paul Bunyan's ox. <laughs> so. Go, go, go ahead, but yeah, that horn may not be out of commission, which I hadn't even thought of, really. So, no, it might it might be being stashed for a rainy day. It's very plausible. A meteor rain, a <laughs> storm of swords. <laughs> so yeah, it could be a matching horn. It could be some Azor high shit. Um, could be some. I am a fan of the idea that magic exists a priori in the world, and the humans. Do different things with it. So Reloris used fire magic. Valerians use fire magic. Nobody owns it. Fire magic is a thing that theoretically anyone could use, which is why I think Euron could potentially mess with ice magic, just because he's looking to mess with any kind of magic. So mm-hmm. he doesn't have to become an other to use ice magic necessarily. Um, the horn technology. So, like, what's the magic here? Now, George doesn't like to get too technical, but is it the fact the horn comes from an animal? What about those metal bands that have glyphs inside? So that seems to be part of the magic too, right? So it seems almost like if you take the horn of a certain kind of animal and you use runes and metal bands and probably enchantments when you're putting it together, then maybe you can create a magic horn. Now, these could all be the same horn. You know, like the idea the horn of Jorman brings down the wall. Well... If Dragonbinder has anything to do with comets and meteors and stuff, then that's how it could bring down the wall. Um, there's the biblical story of Joshua blowing blowing the trumpets and the walls of Jericho falling down. Sound can do things like that, especially magical sounds could create an earthquake. So there could be just horn technology that's been discovered by ancient first men and Valerians. But... Seeing as how it's a fantasy story and everything is, you know, a mystery that probably ties together, it's also very possible that it's the same horn technology and that those ancient great empire of the Dawn people, because that's who we're talking about with Azor High, they were in Westeros using green seer magic. So maybe the first men learned from them or vice versa as far as how to make magic horns. Yeah, yeah, it all seems like it, it can go hand in hand. Um, I don't really have much to say on the, on the horn, uh, except for that it, when we get to later Victorian chapters, it also seems to have like just this beckoning to it. Like the call for Victorian to give it a toot is just so overwhelming. And I don't think that he's going to be able to resist. That's, that's an interesting idea. Um, and Victorian... He's already begun to transform his physiology, this is getting ahead of things, through R'hllor magic, of course. He has the fire hand. He's mm-hmm. been doctored upon by, by the red priest Makoro. And so now he has this burning hand that's stronger than before, but it sort of crackles. It's just sort of always on fire a little bit. So smoldering, kind of smoking. So... It's possible that Victorian is on the way to being someone who could blow the horn and not die because of his relorist magic that is inside his body, inside his hand at least. What do you think about yeah. that? Yeah, if Victorian is becoming some form of fire white, then it might give him some sort of immunity where he might be able to blow the horn and not have the same things happen to him that happened to Craigorn in the last chapter. Yeah, and I unpacked this more in the Melisandre Secrets series, which I strongly, highly recommend everybody watch. It goes along with our discussion lately really well. There's different things happening with Rolorist physiology, okay? Melisandre is not, as far as we know, dead. She seems to be doing a slow transformation because she thinks, soon I won't need to sleep at all. She barely needs to sleep. 
and she already doesn't need to eat. Relora nourishes her. She can eat to keep up appearances, quote unquote. I don't want to freak people out, you know. Um, but she doesn't need to eat or sleep. She runs on fire magic. She's becoming a fire spirit, like a fire other. Um, then we have the whites on both sides. So just as on the ice side, we have the ice spirits, the others. They're like beings made of ice. And then we have ice whites. On the Rolora side, we have fire whites. And we have Mel. Makoro also, I think, is doing a transformation due to the fact that he survived at sea for 10 days, eating nothing, you know what I mean? Just floating in the ocean. Like that's, he's, and his skin also is like inhumanly black. It's like magically black. So it's like burnt looking and his eyes and his face, his tattoo moves. His, bo his body is magically altered. It's very strongly suggested. So I think, I think, there is a Rolorist transformation. And then there's what's happening with Victarion, which happened all of a sudden. Like Melisandre's working with fire magic, and that's transforming her. Every time she uses magic, it says the fire was inside of her, transforming her. So it seems like every time she uses Rolor magic, brings her a little closer, or a little farther away from being a human. Victarion, Makoro just went in the cabin... And they prayed, and all the monkeys jumped off the boat, and everyone freaked out, got real weird. And then Victorian yeah. comes out with a fire hand. Uh, so, and the other, and the other thing that changes is since since Melisandre seems to be doing a more slower, more methodical approach uh, in her pep point of view chapter, it's still from her point of view. But with Victorian, if you, there's a shift after he gets the firearm, his chapter switch from a first person point of view to a third person so it's almost as if he's not telling his own story anymore yeah it's suspicious it's kind of there is actually one or two other places in the story where that happens but it does george doesn't do that much so he wanted to either yeah. obscure what was going on in there or he's telling us something like what you're saying like victorian wasn't there for a minute yeah, it, it's um, like it's like with victorians it's it's the it's while it, while it happens every so often with Victorians, you can it seems to be a much more deliberate, a uh, deliberate style of writing change and much more, uh, much more noticeable. So, um, what I was getting around to saying, where is Atlantis Morissette's Fire Transformed Melisandre. It's somewhere. I know she made it. Why can't I find it? Oh, you're like me. Not <laughs> trying to find your artwork. I usually label it pretty well. Uh, Bonero also is suspicious as far as his phys physiology goes. Um... I think that Melisandre, everyone knows that her appearance is probably glamoured. I think underneath she probably looks more like Makoro. Like kind of blackened and charred and like burnt and stuff. I think that's what happens. Um, but let me see if I can find... Well, this so this is... Um, this one that I'm about to show is by... This is from, this is a show art, but this is showing her when she was sort of, dis, her glamour was fading away, you know, uh, by Inna Vuzhanina, V-J-U-Z-H-A-N-I-N-A. She does a lot of great show art. So that's one, but the one I'm looking for here, uh, now that we're getting into Melisandre art, mm, I have a few pieces. That's one of my very favorites. This captures the inhuman look the best to me, Waldemar Pietka. That's just very unnerving. <laughs> um, I am so frustrated. Why cannot I find this artwork? Okay, well, I guess we've got to go on. But <laughs> point is, underneath the glamour, I think Melisandre probably looks like Makoro. Um, and so there's multiple ways, to get back to Victorian, there's multiple ways that... Rolorist magic can be used to alter physiology. So it is possible, potentially, that he could blow the horn and not die. 
But it's also very possible that blowing the horn is the trap the Victoria, that Euron has set. All Euron's gifts are poisoned. The horn is kind of like a gift. He wants to blow it. He's being told that mortal men can't blow it. So the, the most obvious thing is that he'll eventually blow it and he'll die. Um, that could be the way that he goes out like a sucker. Because we know that Euron's going to spring a trap on him sooner or later, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's no way that Victarion's going to pull one over on Euron. I think Euron has all of his ducks in a row as far as this goes. That would be and... a funny plot twist. <laughs> <laughs> no, ain't going to happen. Okay, I'm still looking for this art. It's so good. I don't know why I can't find it. But I can't. Oh. Atlantis, if you're in the chat, maybe it's... Uh, maybe it's... um on her insta no i've used it i know i've used it in a video uh well if you need coverage i actually said i actually do have um i've been doing research since the last stream and i said i actually have a lot more mythical astronomy to contribute this time around so well, so i was going to ask you about that yeah go ahead and give us that before we get into this chapter and this is this will be yeah. some of tim's notes from the the uh, the dragon binder king's mooch we only did three and a half hours so we didn't get enough time you know to explain yeah, everything. go ahead tim well, last last time I talked a lot about Taurus and the moon, and uh, I didn't even get into the other things about Taurus, which is the star clusters, uh, the Hyades and the Pleiades. And so I started looking more into this and Greek myth, as well as the red star itself, Aldebaran. So, and there's actually a lot to a lot to go with this, and I can actually connect it to moon meteor theory, and I think it could actually lend a bit more credence to moon meteor theory. These actual phenomena that take place with with these uh with aldebaran are you going um, to the torrid meteor stream is that what we're talking about well i'm going into uh the exaltations and the occultations of aldebaran these are real cosmic phenomena that happen with aldebaran and the moon and then so also can you just... set the stage for us so that everyone knows why you're bringing oh, this up sure sure okay so um i always my big thing is relating Euron to the king in yellow, Hastor, who is the Lovecraftian, who is a Lovecraftian storm god, brother of Cthulhu, like, and uh, just how the drowned god of Ironborn religion is Cthulhu. His drowned, his drowned watery halls are akin to the sunken city of Ryla, and then the storm god who lives in his kingdom in the clouds is akin to Hastor, who lives in a celestial city on the star of Aldebaran. Aldebaran now in real in real life Aldebaran is a real star it really is a star in the constellation of Taurus where it it forms Taurus's angry red eye and Aldebaran has a lot of interesting characteristics related to the moon and to the two open star clusters in Taurus the Hyades and the Pleiades which are from Greek myth so the name Aldebaran is an arabic word and it means the follower and it's named this because when aldebaran orbits makes its orbit through the nighttime sky it looks like it is following the pleiades which is one of these open star clusters in taurus uh the pleiades are otherwise they're known as the seven sisters them and the hades they're both water nymphs fathered by atlas uh the hyades are rainmakers, so they're storm bringers and the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, they are the guardian spirits of sailors. And the Red Star follows, follows, the, follows the Pleiades. So when we were talking about how is it that Euron is able to sail so far, so fast, and come back all in one piece, uh, one thing we talked about is he's a storm god avatar. He's like Hastur on Earth, like how he says in the iron captain to asha like oh do i do i control the wind yes you do you're on yes you do but another and that explains how he gets so far so fast uh summoning these cosmic winds like hastor does in lovecraft okay but the other question is how does he make it back it's almost as if he's being like divinely protected and the answer is in this uh aldebaran the red star so when i speak of aldebaran I'm talking about either the red comet as as our stand-in for Aldebaran, or I'm talking about Euron as the symbolic red star on Earth. 
because this is what George does, all right? Um, when it comes to the history, the myth, and the Lovecraft stuff, unlike Lovecraft and his writer friends who would just straight up borrow people, places, and things from each other and throw them in their own stories, what George does is he creates his own symbolic stand-in that it's its own item, it's its own thing, but it functions much the same. What's, what's important are the themes, okay? Themes are important to stories. They're not for book reports, no matter what some hack says. So what's important here are the themes. Like we're never well, going to Well, you know, a good get... way to do a book report would be to identify the theme of the book, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, and it works like when people like say like, oh, you're reaching too far. And it's with like moon meteor theory, things like that. It's like, no, no. All you need to do is recognize the themes draw the parallels to the other stories and remember that George wears his influences on his sleeve. So we're Tim, never let me interrupt get... you and just tell everyone that my video last week, our, our lovely, uh, no, it wasn't the dragon binder one. It was another one I did this week. I showed everyone the thunder clip. Were you watching when I did that? Yeah. Yeah. I watched, it I got yesterday. demonetized for that. That whole video was Oh, not really? eligible for monetization. Yeah, I tried to make it small and skip that. They got me though. That those mm -hmm. Hanna Barbera, they are on you like flies on shit. Uh, okay, anyway. so what I'm getting at. Anyway, so we're we're never gonna have like the actual shining trapezohedron that I've been taught that I talk about. On sorry, page, Tim, sorry, Tim. Let me interrupt you again. You make a good point. I want to just harp on it. So many of the stories that he's drawing from have meteors or broken moons it's thundar yeah. it's lovecraft it's lord of the rings with the meteor swords um elric i believe has meteors in it as well um it definitely has the azor high and this and stuff so yeah um you can uh there's more there's a bunch more but yeah he's go ahead it's it, it's i yeah. definitely at first i thought it was like oh my god this is crazy and then the more literary influences i followed i was like oh okay no it's just not crazy yeah. yeah yeah so so like we're never gonna have the actual trapezohedron but we have things like the sea stone chair uh and toad isle intricate objects carved of black stone just as the trapezohedron is intricate object carved of black stone uh we're never gonna have the actual color drinking meteor from color out of space but we have the buildings of a shy that drink the light and stagai that only gets an hour of sunlight what it's the themes that are relevant here. So we're never going to get the actual red star of Aldebaran, but we do have a stand-in, and that is the red comet. So again, when I talk Aldebaran, in terms of A Song of Ice and Fire, I'm either referring to the red comet or I'm referring to Euron itself, himself. Uh, you're muted. I was just saying that's one in the same. Euron is like the, you know the coming yeah, of doom he yeah the red star is like it's gonna take over the sky you know what i mean like it knocks out yeah. all the other celestial bodies and takes over the sky like it's 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 absolutely euron is the avatar of the red comet the harbinger of doom you know all that stuff yeah, yeah go ahead so i've i've been referring to euron as the red star eye because that's essentially what his personal sigil is so the question of how does Euron make it back in one piece? Well, he's the red star following the Pleiades, which are the guardian spirits of sailors, but it's like a corrupted version. Uh, if we can take, if we compare Euron's voyages, the ones that he claims to have done to Valyrian Ashai, and after the Forsaken, it seems like he was telling the truth about that. And you compare it to Victarion's later voyages, Victarion has no luck. Uh, on his way to Marine. He loses his ships before the first rendezvous point. He gets pelted with shit by monkeys at the Isle of Cedars. <laughs> and the hand wound that he gets in the chapter we're going to read is just getting worse and worse and worse. But after he comes upon Makoro, he also comes upon um, a ship bound for lease full of sex workers, the Willing Maiden. And he takes oh. of that, he... Seven. He yeah, he t he chooses the seven most beautiful women, in his opinion, and he sacrifices them. He puts them on a fishing skid, sets it afire, and sinks it. And he says, this is to honor both the red god of Makoro as a payment for fixing his arm, and the drowned god. Those who burn go to R'hllor, those who drown go to the drowned god. 
but it's after this sacrifice that Victorian's luck turns around and then we get the sample chapters where he makes it to Marine. So it's almost like, yeah, guardian spirits of sailors. Like it's it's almost like mafia protection. We'll protect you for a cost. So it's like a corrupted version of the Pleiades. This is how Euron is able to sail so far. Uh, guardian spirits at a cost. That's awesome. Um, there's some really interesting stuff in those chapters, which we'll get to um, mm -hmm. about the wake. Um, the the ship leaves a, a wake that reflects in the moonlight and it basically becomes a comet on the yeah. ocean. Um, and it's, a, it, and it's, it's right in that same chapter. So that's interesting. He's burning the seven sisters. Yeah. That's, that's a very bad omen. <laughs> it's a very unholy then, act. So that's Aldebaran and the Pleiades. Then there's Aldebaran in the moon. So now okay. I talked about, I talked last stream, how uh, every one of the celestial, the seven celestial wanderers has an exaltation that corresponds to a uh, to a zodiac constellation, um, and our the moon corresponds to Taurus. Now, what an exaltation is, it roughly means that as these as the celestial wanderers make their orbit, they at some point they all pass through their respective constellations. So the moon passes through Taurus. Now we know the moon doesn't orbit at a perfect circle. They all moons, planets, they orbit at it at an imperfect elliptical. So every year as the moon makes it around the sun, it's in a slightly different spot than it was the year before. And what ends up happening is every couple of years as the moon makes its way around and it, and it wanders away because that's what it is. It's a wanderer. Uh, it finds itself in front of a star and this is called an occultation. This is when a moon or a planet finds itself in front of a star and either partially or fully blocks it, depending on the respective sizes. Moon does this. It's it's a cosmic phenomena that happens every 18 years. So you, you can actually chart this. Uh, and it lasts for a period of three and a half years. So the last time this happened was in January of 2015, and it lasted till September of 2018. And it's set to happen again in 2033, where the moon finds its way in front of a star now, big guest chat, which star does the moon stop in front of? I'll give you a hint. It's Aldebaran. But Aldebaran is a, is a red giant. It's much, much, much bigger than the moon. So the moon is only partially blocking it. It's just sort of standing in front of it. So for that three and a half year period, the moon becomes a part of the eye of Taurus. So now, as the moon is standing in front of Aldebaran, it looks that way from our point of view in the night sky. Reality is there's light years of distance separating the two. The chances of Aldebaran over... You're muted again. <laughs> My jokes are all late now. I just say, go on and shatter the illusion for us, Tim. Ruin the magic. Yeah. You're going to tell us Santa Claus isn't real next, but go ahead. <laughs> well, so, so the chances of Aldebaran overtaking and swallowing the moon, they're not going to happen. That's not going to happen until our own sun goes red giant in five billion years. But so the moon, but the moon stops in front of the red star. But for the purposes of our story, the red star isn't a star, it's a comet. It's an object hurtling through space at a much, much faster speed on its own trajectory. So now if the moon, precocious little wanderer that it is, were to wander its way into the path of the red comet, what's going to happen? Well, it's a good time to steal a wife, Tim, when the red wanderer is in the moon maid. <laughs> but yeah, so you uh, had said in these la in these last few streams, like what ca what caused the first long night? A comet hitting the moon. And now what is just set to happen? Well, if the red comet is our stand in for Aldebaran and the moon and our moon, our real life moon wanders in front and stops in front of Aldebaran, then it seems plausible that the moon here will stop in front of the red comet and get in its path. But since the red comet is moving through space at a much faster speed than a star that's on its own orbit, then it seems like the comet is going to hit the moon. And it's like, well, who's going to guide the comet? And you would even tend to be like, maybe there is something sort of guiding this comet. And I'm here to say, yeah, there is. It's the yellow crack and storm God that lives on it. But that's, and that is Euron. Who's, who is the yellow crack and storm god? Euron. Who's the red star eye? Euron. Who's gonna 
Who's going to lead the comet into the moon? Euron. And who has the most to gain? Kyle. Euron. So check this out. Euron's face tells the story. This is great. So Euron, the name, refers to Europa, which is an ice moon of Jupiter. Um, Euron, George confirms that when he gives us Aaron Dampere's vision, where he says the moon leered with Euron's face over a black wine sea. So Euron's face, and the word Euron... And Europa, the root word there means like broad and bright. So it's like a broad, bright face. That's that's Europa, Euron, okay? Mm -hmm. So he's got this moon face, but his two eyes are telling us things, right? So he's got the blood eye, as you can see here. He usually keeps the blood eye under a patch, like that. And so the blood eye is hidden. His blue smiling eye is out. So... The smiling eye, that's, of course, two moons. One moon is gone. The moons are ice and fire, right? So his blue eye is your ice moon. That's the one that's showing, okay? The other eye is the one, is the blood one. It's like, it's the old moon. It's already been bloodied. It's turned dark. It's been put out, okay? We see this all the time. Waymar gets one eye put out, and then his other eye lights up blue. So that's the one moon, psh getting put out, okay, it, with a, a shard of the so, broken sword needle. So a sword shard, a good comet image, right? And then his other eye lights up blue. So, of course, a smiling eye, the crescent, think of a Cheshire cat, smiling moon, crescent moon, it's already equated with a smile. So a blue smiling eye, that's the, that's the ice moon. That's the one we have left. So what Euron is going to do is going to summon the comet back to hit the remaining moon. Mm -hmm. And in Dampere's vision, what does he do? Not only does he reveal the blood eye, he the blue eye is hidden. So now his smiling eye is exposed. So it's like, oh, the blue eye, that's the ice moon, it's now been put out or blackened. And what can we see? That red star. So his face is telling us the whole story. It's a moon face. Just when you say Aldebaran in front of the moon, literally his blood eye in front of his moon face. Like, it's the image of it. Mm -hmm. So, very cool. Good work there. And Euron's face is all about mythical astronomy. He's literally a sky map face telling us the story. I've, I've caught on to that years ago. It's one of the reasons why I'm so hyped about his symbolism. But Yeah. Yeah, when I got into this and I found more and I found all this stuff, I was like, oh, I got to tell I got to tell Dave this stuff. I got to bring this up. And then there's more there's more to it later on. But I, that's more for uh, later on when we talk more you're on Endgame. So I might save it for the end of the stream. And that is how Euron relates to Atlas, who is the father of the Hyades, the Pleiades. I got more on that with okay. Atlas and his, his brothers, Prometheus and Epimetheus. Well, let me... Um segue that into our chapter reread because the whole idea of Euron is this character who calls the comet he is the comet um basically if you want to think like who's calling the comet it's like the thing that Euron serves you know the lion of night calls the comet um Euron is sort of the avatar of the lion of night in that the bloodstone emperor serves the lion of night okay so <clears throat> The important thing here is that we, we've, we said before, Victorian is a comet figure. That's what he does. He flies around and smashes into things. Now, he is sent by Euron. So Euron is basically throwing Victorian around at stuff. And Victorian smashes it and breaks it and burns it. So that's the idea. And what is Euron doing? He's sending Vic to Marine to find Danny. Danny is a moon character. So here we have Euron, the great other, the blackness of space, if you want to say. He's calling the comet, Victorian, and he's sending it, hurling it at the moon, Danny. And that is supposed to bring back dragons. That's the yeah. whole point. It's going to bring back dragons. And he's using a horn. So this is the whole mythical astronomy scenario. Bloodstone Emperor Azor Ahai using the horn calling the comet, sending it to hit the moon, and then that calls the dragons down to Earth, the meteor dragons, one of which is the black stone that he uses 
to take power, like the like the trapezohedron. So the whole scenario is being paralleled in the act of Euron sending Victarion to Slaver's Bay to bring back Danny and her dragons. Um, and potentially, if Danny's brought back to Westeros, she may be brought back even as a captive, which kind of fits the symbolism. Either that or she'll be tricked, essentially. She'll be tricked into thinking Euron is a good ally when obviously he wants to probably kill her and use her for blood magic. So, you know, Nissa Nissa style. So that's the setup here. And in this chapter, it opens with a battle. And Victarion is going to be in the middle of a battle. He's compared to a bull a lot of times. He was compared to a bull before in the chapters we already read, and it's about to happen in this chapter. But remember, he's like a golden bull. So he's like a fiery bull. So you could think of Taurus on fire. You could think of the dragon comet as a bull comet. Obviously, you know, two charging horned animals that you don't want to be in front of. Right? A bull or a dragon. So it works just as well. But that's what we're going to see is Victarion bowling people over, knocking people over. He's going to attack a crescent formation. But So let's go ahead and rip into the chapter here. You want to start it off, Tim? Sure. The drums, okay, I'm just going to remove my eye patch so I can read better. Uh, the drums were pounding out a battle beat as the Iron Victory swept forward, her ram cutting through the choppy green waters. The smaller ship ahead was turning, or slapping at the sea. Roses streamed upon banners, fore and oft a white rose upon a red... I actually don't know this word. Do you know how to pronounce that? Upon a red S. Escuchion. Escuchion. Yeah. Thank you. That's how I'll say it. Escuchion. Atop her mast, a golden one on a field as green as grass. The Iron Victory raked her side so hard that half the boarding party, party lost their feet. Oars snapped and splintered. Sweet music to the captain's ears. He vaulted okay, so over. Stop right there. Let's first first sentence always sets the stage. So let's see what it, what we've got. So there's drums pounding out a battle beat. We've identified that before as the the drumming of like you know, shamanistic rituals, the heartbeat of the weirwoods, um, things like that. And sure enough, what are we doing? We're boarding something and we're cutting through choppy green waters. So we're in the green sea and we're cut, we're plowing through it um, and we're chasing somebody. So this is essentially Azor High chasing down Nissa Nissa in the green sea. And these the who we're chasing it's all about these roses okay now rose is a great moon symbol we know the winter rose is the all the ice moon maidens have that so the red rose lend itself towards a fire moon because it's all about the blood and the blooming um there's you know the a flower that opens and unfolds that's like the moon exploding essentially um there's a battle where tywin's army unfolds like a black iron rose in the sun like that's that's the great one um but yeah so we're gonna see these red the red rose that's the nissa nissa character or the moon um nissa nissa is male this time it's okay it's mythical astronomy but that's that's the figure here so there's a boarding party the comet azor high team that's victarian uh is is in pursuit trying to pull down the moon. Because remember, the Kraken pulls things down. So we get the fiery Kraken pursuing House Sari. Go ahead. He vaulted over the gunwale. Landing on the deck below with his golden cloak billowing behind him, the white roses drew back as men always did at the sight of Victorian Greyjoy, armed and armored, his face hidden behind his Kraken helm. They were clutching swords and spears and axes, but nine of every ten wore no armor, and the tenth only had a shirt of sewn scales. These are no Iron Men, Victorian thought. They still fear drowning. Get him, one man shouted. He's alone. Come, he roared back. Come kill me if you can. From all sides, the rosy warriors converged, with gray steel in their hands and terror behind their eyes. Their fear was so ripe, Victorian could taste it. Left and right he laid about, hewing off the first man's arm at the elbow, cleaving through the shoulder of the second. The third buried his own axe head in the soft pine of Victorian's shield. He slammed it into the fool's face, knocked him off his feet, and slew him when he tried to rise again. 
As he was struggling to free his axe from the dead man's rib cage, a spear jabbed him between the shoulder blades. It felt as though someone had slapped him on the back. Victorian spun and slammed his axe down onto the spearman's head, feeling the impact in his arm as the steel went crunching through helm and hair and skull. The man swayed for half a heartbeat till the iron captain wrenched the steel free and sent his corpse staggering loose-limbed across the deck, looking more drunk than dead. So, stop you right there. So, so far we've got two suggestions that were fighting whites. I just, this is jumping out to me. Um, he killed somebody and then slew him when he tried to rise again. That sounds like we're killing him twice. And then we have the corpse is staggering across the deck looking more drunk than dead. So it's kind of an animated sounding corpse that he's fighting there. Um, how Sari, I just looked up the meaning of the word Sari. It means to crowd together, especially in ranks. And that's literally what they're doing on this ship is they're going to end up crowding together around the mast as Victorian attacks them. So I have to think that how Sari's name was invented just for this chapter. It's kind of cool. Um, go ahead. You're, you're doing, you're doing great. So just keep reading, I guess. Okay. By then his iron board had followed him down onto the deck of the broken long ship. He heard Wolf One Ear let out a howl as he went to work, glimpsed Ragnar Pike in his rusted mail, saw Newt the Barber send a throwing axe spinning through the air to catch a man in the chest. Victorian slew another man and another. He would have killed a third, but Ragnar cut him down first. Well struck, Victorian bellowed at him. When he returned to find the next victim for his axe, he spied the other captains across the deck. His white shirt coat was spotted with blood and gore, but Victorian can make out the arms upon his breast, the white rose within its red escutcheon. The man bore the same device upon his shield on a white field with a red embattled border. You, the iron captain called across the carnage. You of the rose, be you the lord of South Shield? The other raised his visor to show a beardless face. His son and heir, Sir Talbert Sari. And who are you, Kraken? Your death, Victorian bulled toward him. Okay, Sari. So, yeah. no, okay. let's, let's pause right there. We're about to get a sick battle, so let's just stop and do a quick little bit of symbolism. Um, let's see here. White surcoat spotted with blood and gore. Remember I said this is Nissa Nissa being chased in the weirwood net, so in her dying moments or already dead in the weirwood net. So spotted, that's the dappled symbolism. Remember the children of the forest. Their skin is spotted and dappled like a doe. Nissa Nissa figures always have spotted and dappling. Arya has dappling. Cersei gets it. It's always there. The spotted Silva, with Silva being like Sylvan, like a like a dryad. So spotted Silva. That's that's Nissa Nissa. So she um uh and then importantly with blood and gore. So it gives you the death symbolism spotted with blood, you know, a sacrifice, child of the forest. That's the idea. And then we see the white rose within the red Astuchian. These are also weirwood colors, white and red, white and mm -hmm. red. So pretty obvious what kind of sacrifice we're talking about here. Nissa Nissa, sacrifice to the weirwood. This will be more obvious as the chapter goes on. I already know what's going to happen. The spoiler alert. Um, and then the shield is important too. We see the weirwood is associated with doors and shields both, protecting measures with wards, barriers, things like that. So think of um, the shield table in the the Lord Commander's chamber, where the where the, uh, the Kingsguard, Tim, I keep forgetting the word Kingsguard, where the Kingsguard meet. They sit around a weirwood table. Um, so that's another other's weirwood clue. But there's weird, a lot of weirwood doors, all that stuff. So... South Shield. Not only is the all the sim all the stuff on the shield, he's the Lord of South Shield. So, it, yeah. It, yeah, it just gets to this whole idea that like Nissa Nissa's death opens a door that lets all these bad things out, right? Yeah, because when you say like, if we picture this uh, white rose stained with blood, it's we got like the white stem and it's flower bloodied and it's like a just a smaller version of a weirwood the white trunk with the red leaves this is it's a small plant it's a big plant but the symbolism is right there and of course 
roses with the hey, every rose has its thorn, which cuts mm-hmm. you. So there's the implication of bleeding to the plants is right there. Um, and marriage and true love. Okay, so let me let me uh, let me take a turn here. Hang on. Sure. Your death, Victorian, bold towards him. So there's a bull reference. Sari leapt to meet him. His long sword was good castle forged steel, and the young knight made it sing. His first cut was low, and Victorian deflected it off of his axe. His second caught the iron captain on the helm before he got his shield up. Victorian answered with a sidearm blow of his axe. Sari's shield got in the way. Wooden splinters flew, and the white rose split lengthwise with a sweet sharp crack. So, I don't have to tell you, hopefully, one big white rose splitting in half with a crack that's our moon cracking P- pretty obvious it's it's literally guys the moon is cracking it's cracking <laughs> <laughs> the kraken cracked the moon with a sweet sharp crack it split lengthwise the young knight's long sword hammered at his thigh once twice thrice screaming against the steel oh my god seems like nissa is screaming and then we got a hammer of the waters. Once, twice, thrice. Is that three moon meteors, Tim? That's what we've always speculated. One of them is the hammer of the waters. This boy is quick, the Iron Captain realized. He smashed his shield in Sari's face and sent him staggering back against the gunwale. Staggering back. I just read that in the John Corn chapter. They're both staggering backward. And I was like, ah, these are stag men being turned backwards, being manipulated turned into something else. So staggering backwards, the Nissa Nissa figure. Um, let's see here. Victorian raised his axe, put all his weight behind his cut to open the boy from neck to groin. Oh, Victorian with an axe. Axes are for chopping down trees, right? So he's, <laughs> he's chopping the moon down and he's chopping at this rose warrior who's our weirwood warrior, okay? Chopping at the weirwood, attacking Nissa Nissa at the same time. To open the boy from neck to groin. So we're trying to open a door, guys. But Sari spun away. The axe head crashed through the rail, sending splinters flying, and lodged there when he tried to pull it free. So now Azor Ahai is stuck. He was trying to chop down that weirwood tree, but he got stuck. The deck moved under his feet. So the world is now off its axis, and he stumbled to one knee. It's time to pray. Sir Talbert cast away his broken shield and slashed down with his longsword. Victorian's own shield had twisted half around when he stumbled. He caught Sari's blade in an iron fist. Lobstered steel crunched, and a stab of pain made him grunt, yet Victorian held on. I am quick as well, boy, he said, as he ripped the sword from the knight's hand and flung it into the sea. So that's a great one. That's where I'll stop. I'll let you pick up the reading here, Tim. So this is... Back in the day when I first read this chapter, I think that was the first mythical astronomy that I caught. It was like, oh, the sword going into the sea. That's an important one. That's the meteor that lands in the sea. That's specifically important to the Iron Islands. That's Mm -hmm. the sea dragon meteor that drowns the islands that probably shattered the land and flooded the neck. So here we have the Kraken character literally grabbing the moon's sword and throwing it into the sea. So this is the same symbol as the sorcerer reaching up with his comet sword, stabbing the moon, and then casting the moon meteors down into the sea. So that's what Victorian is doing. That's the same thing he's going to do with Danny. He's being sent across the sea to smash into Danny and bring the dragons back across the sea again. So, um, yeah, also catching so catching the, the sword, that's kind of like a mutual collision there kind of a thing um i have wondered tim i have so the original moon was broken right yeah it gave us the dragon meteors i think that the remainder of the moon might be the red comet now um in fundar it's not a red comet but like a, a a runaway planet actually that looks like a comet and melisandre is kind of the key here she is a fire moon character, Nissa Nissa character. She bursts the shadow babies 
instead of birthing dragons. The same idea, though. She takes the fire, fire of the sun of Stannis and births his his black clone children. Okay. However, mm-hmm. she's also like the Red Comet. She is the Red Star. She sets everything on fire. She's from somewhere else and comes to Westeros. You know what I mean? Kind of like Euron. Yeah. And sets everything on fire, burns people. So it's almost like some remnant of the moon that got smashed became a comet or something like that. Or the comet now possesses the soul of the moon that it killed or some shit like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because if uh, if we accept this idea of a sec of there once being a second moon that got hit, broke apart, the pieces, some pieces would fall to Earth, but the pieces that didn't would still be hurtling through space. And so they'd still be out there and they'd be, because of the force of impact, they would be moving like comets, hurtling through space at a much, much faster speed than they were when they were part of the moon. Yeah, so there'd be some bits that would be in the moon's orbit, like a debris field. Um, Mm -hmm. There'd be some bits that could be knocked out into space. It did seem like what George might be talking about is two pairs, two comets, um, because the whole Ned sword ice gets split into two identical red swords. And there's... Mm -hmm. All these pairs of swords, like if you go back, like um, Blackfire and uh, Dark Sister and uh, a couple others. And so it seems like maybe, you know, one comet hit one moon and the other comet is still trucking and coming back for the other moon. But it's all yeah. getting in the weeds. It's, it's hard to get a specific answer on that. But it does seem sometimes like that destroyed moon turns into the comet. Um and that would be kind of like some of the Nissa Nissa characters. Remember when they're undead, I've said, oh, sometimes they look like Night's Queen, but sometimes they don't. So like Lady Stoneheart, she's got the red fiery eyes of Relore, and she's looking at Oathkeeper and her red eyes are matching the red eyes on the cat on the sword. She's a red eyed cat. The, the pommel is a red eyed cat. They're like red stars. So it could be like, and Stoneheart is like the crone. She's the hang woman. She kills everyone. She goes around the Riverlands executing people. So it's almost like she's become that death messenger figure, um, like Euron or Melisandre. So that could be the same pattern there. Yeah. No, it makes sense because if we think of this, go back to that story, uh, the moon cracked like an egg and birth and dragons spilled forth. But if comets and meteors are our symbolic dragons, then yeah, the moon splitting, breaking apart and turning into comets and meteors and becoming our space dragons. Like it, that makes sense. So not sure how exactly it works, but um, some, something like that. And And so here we see all this stuff about the white rose getting split down, cut like a tree. It's pretty good. I love how it's both moon destruction symbolism and weirwood destruction symbolism. And of course, weirwood door looks like moonlight. The moon door is made of weirwood. Nissa Nissa is analogous to the weirwood and the moon. So basically that's it. Like comets, dragons, and flaming swords are all the same. Nissa Nissa, the weirwood, and the moon are all analogous. And so here we have this white rose... It's like a weirwood tree. It's white and red. It's a plant. It's getting cut down. It's chopped in half. Um, its sword gets thrown into the water. That's really my favorite. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, I mean, so I think I'm I... quick as well, boy, he said, as he ripped a sword from the knight's hand and flung it into the sea. Go ahead, Tim. Sir Talbert's eyes went wide. My sword... Victorian caught the lad about the throat with a bloody fist. Go and get it, he said, forcing him backwards over the side into the blood-stained waters. That won him a respite to pull his axe loose. The I'm white sorry. Rose of- sorry, I should have just read that part too. I'm so sorry. So Nissa Nissa <laughs> just got thrown into the green sea. Because remember, the water was labeled as green in the first sentence. So we threw the moon meteor sword in the sea. And then we just went ahead and threw Nissa Nissa in the sea too. Go and get it. It's the same thing. We're just throwing the moon into the sea. But before that happened, grab Nissa Nissa by the throat. So we have that red smile, choked symbolism, just like Stoneheart, or Catelyn rather, that weirwood smile, because it's a blood, what does it say? Um, yeah, so uh, where was it? 
He caught the lad about the throat with a bloody fist. Right. So that's so so now it's a bloody throat that he's just given him and then thrown thrown into the sea. So that's pretty awesome. Nissa Nissa into the green sea symbolism. And of course, Catelyn literally thrown into the green fork of the trident as well. Um, it, so it says he pulled his axe loose. The white roses were falling back before the iron tide. So now there's like we had this one white rose that was a moon. It got split in half. So now the white roses are falling everywhere. Okay. And there's an iron tide. That's the same idea. Well, it's that's the tide of meteors in the sky, the waves of blood and night. They're made of iron. So, or moon rock at least. Uh, so that won him a respite to pull his axe loose. The white roses were falling back before the iron tide. Some tried to flee below decks as others cried for quarter. Victorian could feel warm blood trickling down his fingers beneath the mail and leather and lobstered plate, but that was nothing. Around the mast, a thick knot of foemen fought on, standing shoulder to shoulder in a ring. These few are men, at least. They would sooner die than yield. Victorian would grant some of them that wish. He beat his axe against his shield and charged them. So this right, is so the ring of people, so that's a moon circle. They're gathered around the mast, which is like a tree. So it's both a moon ring... And again, a tree symbol. Once the moon and the tree, the same thing. Also, again, House Sari means to gather together in ranks. So the men of House Sari are Sarying. But go ahead. Oh, well, I want to talk about because of this mentioning the, the, when he keeps mentioning the lobstered plate. Like, okay, so you're uh, mm. you're on a Victorian or Kraken symbolically, the Kraken's the sigil, and your Victorians were in a Kraken hell, but then they also have this lobstered steel and lobstered plate. Uh, lobster again it's more talk of imagery of sea creatures as people which is more squisher talk and this is to bring back to lovecraft it's making us think of the deep ones and then when victorian catches sari sword in his lobster plate plated fist um that is like a, it's like a squisher squisher catching a meteor well comparing that bringing that back to lovecraft because that's what we do the black stone that becomes the trapezohedron, which would be our stand in here for the black stone that the blood that falls to earth here. It is purposely left here by these elder, by these elder things, these, these sea creature like aliens. So again, so you think squisher catching a meteor, it's like, it's like the, uh, the old ones purposely dropping this black stone onto earth. It's also the sea stone chair portrait yeah. like the sea stone chair is a kraken and it's meteor stone both mm -hmm. so yeah, that's kind of what we just saw when the lobstered steel caught the meteor it's like oh we just made the sea stone chair yeah yeah so and this is just meta commentary here this is why george's writing is like mythology because in mythology and this builds on what tim was saying earlier like None of this stuff that we're talking about is like far-fetched. This is actually classic literature. This is how it works. In a, in a mythical tale, every object and act is significant, not only for its role in the story, but in the ideas that are associated with said act or archetype. You know, bathing, uh, killing, having sex, fighting, any of these things, um, picking up things, carrying things, preparing something, catching something, any action that you can do is associated with various ideas and concepts. And a mythical story is written so that every single move and, and detail of the story is representative, is symbolic. A Song of Ice and Fire clearly is written that way. And so when we see these battle scenes, every act means something. And we see that the same motifs are repeated over and over again in the chapter, that's to let us know that this is on purpose and that George mm -hmm. wants us to think about one or two motifs in particular. So we've got a yeah. lot of things being thrown into the sea, being caught by lobsters. Um, you, you can see this is all about the sea dragon meteor because the, the Iron Islands was shaped by that meteor impact that drowned mm -hmm. the neck and collapsed the land, left them the sea stone chair, and potentially, you know, um, the original Ironborn coming to the Iron Islands may have had something to do with the long night and the fallout of the Great Empire of the Dawn and all that stuff. So 
their whole culture was shaped by the Sea Dragon Meteor, by the Black Stone, by Azor High. Um, so that's yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah, because like we said, like these these repeating themes, these repeating motifs, they happen so much and so often. It's way too much to be coincidence. So all you got to do is just like, okay, well then just start looking at them and start connecting the dots and just look at the influences from George's the writers that George liked and the myth and history that he grew up studying, and all you just connect the dots from there, and you can draw your own parallels. So there it is. Um... And that makes it, that's the whole point of doing these chapter rereads is to like, is to bring out that second layer um, as much as we can. And a lot of times it leads us to theories, but sometimes it's just appreciating the, like, it's just George doubling up on the sort of thematic and emotional impact of the scene by using these archetypal, you know, deeds and acts. So... You're throwing things into the sea just itself. It's sacred in ironborn culture. And and Victorian's about to talk about the courage of people who wear mail at, at sea. I didn't want to spoil it because he's gonna give his own thoughts. So let's keep reading. Um where were we here? The ring of people you were just about to read. It was those the drowned god had had not shaped him. Go ahead. The drowned god had not shaped Victorian Greyjoy to fight with words at King's Moots, nor struggle against furtive sneaking foes in endless bogs. This was why he had been put on earth, to stand steel-clad with an axe red and dripping in his hand, dealing death with every blow. They hacked at him from front and back, but their swords might have been willow switches for all the harm they did him. No blade could cut through Victorian Greyjoy's heavy plate, nor did he give his foes the time to find the weak points at the joints, where only mail and wet leather warded him. Let three men assail him, or four or five, it made no matter. He slew them one at a time, trusting in his steel to protect him from the others. As each foe fell, he turned his wrath upon the next. Okay. So that's that line right there. We already got another other reference, trusting in his steel to protect him from the others. And there's been two. Um, Sari was, was the other... Um earlier and is smooth cheeked as well so why would the nissa nissa and weirwood figure be also the others well because this is when the others are created when azel rahai invades the green sea invades the weirwood net setting things on fire crashing things chopping things sacrificing nissa nissa that's when the others are created the others are the weirwood spirits who are evicted from the weirwood tree when azel rahai makes it his home that's what I've been saying for years. And so here, these weirwood figures are being chopped. And not only the other reference, right there, it said, let three men assail him, or four, or five. That's the prologue where Waymar's counting the others. He's like, three, four, five. It's the same thing. So we see that sequence here of the others emerging from the wood at the moment that Azor Ahai is smashing into the trees. And what is Waymar doing in the prologue? He's invading the haunted forest when everything tells him to turn back and he's headstrong. He's got his black sable cloak on just like you're on, by the way, that night sable cloak symbol. And he's invading the woods and then it's three, four, five, the others. So same thing here. We're chopping down at these Rose Knights who, by the way, are attacking Victorian with willow switches as if they were trees. You catch that? Mm -hmm. That was great. Yep. So, they're the others, and they're being flushed out because we're violating the weirwood net. As each foe fell, he turned his wrath upon the next. Okay, I'll pick this up. <clears throat> the last man to face him must have been a smith. He had shoulders like a bull, and one much more muscular than the other. His armor was studded brigandine and a cap of boiled leather. The only blow he landed completed the ruin of Victorian's shield, but the cut the captain dealt in answer split his head in two. Would that I could deal with the crow's eyes, simply. When he jerked his axe head free again, the smith's skull seemed to burst. Blood and bone, weirwood colors, and brain went everywhere, and the corpse fell backward, up against his legs. Too late to plead for quarter now, Victorian thought as he untangled himself from the dead man. So yeah, Victorian is getting tangled. That's more Azor High getting caught and entrapped. Um, but yeah, this sacrifice burst open like a moon. 
blood and bone like the weirwood. So this is another dual weirwood moon death with this last person in the middle of this ring standing against the mast like a like a weirwood sacrifice. Um, the idea that this person was a smith. <clears throat> not sure what to make of that. Um, I guess we're well, usually Azor Ahai is the smith. He's the one who forges the swords from the moon. Um, here, the moon, the dying moon is a smith. I guess the moon is making swords. Or you could say that the exploding moon is like a forge from where the swords are made. But I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. Um, but yeah, there's the, there's the death. So by then, the deck was slick beneath his feet. So everyone's wet now. We're in the sea. And the dead and the dying lay in heaps on every side. He threw his shield away and sucked in air. Lord Captain, he heard the barber say beside him, the day is ours. <clears throat> we've, we've stolen the day now. It belongs to us. And that could be a dawn stealing thing, stealing dawn. Remember I've said it's possible that Night King literally stole the sword dawn from the last hero. You know, or he, that's Azor Ahai stealing the sword from the great empire of the dawn because the Night King steals the sunrise by causing the long night. So... Stealing Dawn kind of makes sense. And there's the whole dragon steel sword, which is probably Dawn or Lightbringer. So it's like, oh, is there a steel, steel wordplay thing going on? Possibly. So here we have um, the day is ours. So this is the day's been stolen. That's that's how I read that, anyways. Go ahead, all around the sea. Um, actually, before I do that, I did have because I just had a late thought. Um, and it's going back to that line about he trusts in his steel to protect him from the others. Um, from yeah, from from a warring standpoint, he trusts the steel in the fight. But the thing is, the thing the steel can't protect him from is his own brother Euron. And if we think of Euron at, in in an other form, uh, Euron uh, trigger warning, Euron physically and sexually abuses Aaron and Yuri. But with Victorian, it's it's not a physical abuse; it's a psychological abuse. We've we've just seen this chapter like Victorian, big guy, really strong, wearing this armor, totally athletic. So for Euron to abuse him, he has to go on it at a more of a psychological level. The, he can't dominate him physically the way he could his other brothers. So I just like that line. Yeah, his steel protect him from the others, but it still won't protect him from Euron because Euron hurts him in other ways. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, uh, yeah, and, and the idea of steel that protects you from the others. Um, it's like, well, there's the whole thing with uh, the runic armor of House Royce. Does that have something to do with protecting against the others? Um, the Valerian steel armor that would protect against the others is also engraven with runes. <clears throat> so... Yeah, there could be something to that idea of s literally steel armor or some sort of armor that protects against the others. But then ultimately it doesn't. Um, you know, catching that sword poisons him as well. And that's that's the thing. I've said that. Azor Ahai going into the Weirwood Net, he gets poisoned. He gets corrupted. He is transformed. He has to die. You have to die to go in the Weirwood Net. So... <clears throat> now, just to be clear, um, Azor High usually is the sun figure, and the comet is his sword, but the comet is also his spirit when we're talking about going into the weirwood net. So, if the moon is the weirwood tree, and I just said the weirwood and the moon are always parallel, then basically what the sun is doing is sending his spirit into the moon, but the comet is his spirit. So when Vermeer Sixkins, for example, invades Thistle, he leaves his body on the ground. That's the sun. The sun dies. The comet is his spirit. It goes into the moon where it also dies or transforms. You know what I mean? So it gets stuck, if you will. And it is in, it is in the weirwood net that the meteor children are conceived. That would also be the others in this case, whose eyes are like stars. So that's what's happening. Euron and Victarion are both Azor High. Kind of. 
you know, Euron is sending Victarion as his right hand. So you can think about Victarion as Azor Ahai's sword. That mm-hmm. works too, because he's, you know, or the, the sun's comet. That all works. Euron being a, a dark sun god. That's what the black crown uh, indicates. <clears throat> so all this stuff about Victarion, he's, he's killing and invading, but he's also, there's signs of him getting trapped and corrupted himself because he caught that sword and now he's, he's being poisoned. He's going to have a rotting infection in his hand. And he's also going to have a bloody hand. That's a going into the weirwood net symbol because the weirwood leaves are bloody hands. So as he's killed Nissa Nissa, he's gained a weirwood symbol hand. That's makes perfect sense. Okay. <clears throat> so let's see what happens next. He untangles himself from the dead man. Uh, the deck is slick beneath his feet. The day is ours. All around the sea was full of ships. Go ahead. Right. The last man to face him must have been a smith. He had shoulders like a bull and one much more muscular than the other. His armor was a studded brigandine. No, 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 no. You're behind. We read that. Oh, we did? All around the sea was full of ships. Some were burning. Okay. Some were burning. Some were sinking. Some had been smashed to splinters. Between the hulls, the water was thick as stew, full of corpses, broken oars, and men clinging to the wreckage. In the distance, half a dozen of Sothran longships were racing back toward the Mander. Let them go, Victarion thought. Let them tell the tale. Once a man had turned his tail and run from battle, he ceased to be a man. His eyes were stinging from the sweat that had run down into them during the fight. Two of his oarsmen helped undo his kraken helm so he might lift it off. Victarion mopped at his brow. That night, he grumbled, the night of the White Rose, did any of you pull him out? A lord's son would be worth a goodly ransom from his father if Lord Sari had survived the day, from his liege at Highgarden if not. None of his men had seen what become of the night after he went over the side, however. Most like the man had drowned. May he feast as he fought in the drowned god's watery halls. Though the men of the Shield Islands called themselves sailors, they crossed the seas in dread and went lightly clad in battle for fear of drowning. Young Sari had been different, a brave man, thought Victorian, almost ironborn. He gave the captured ship to Ragnar Pike, named a dozen men to crew her, and clambered back up onto his own iron victory. Let's, Strip the captain. Okay. Let's. Why don't you? I'll invite you to comment on that. This whole idea of fighting on sea in mail kind of raises the stakes of it because you don't you can't swim if you fall off the deck right so it's you can see victorian has an advantage in the battle but if he slips and goes overboard he's done right Mm -hmm. so yeah and it just shows it shows one both the it shows the confidence of the ironborn and also their faith because they're confident that they can fight these sea battles jump from boat you know jump from boat to boat and go over decks and below in this mail and still live and still make it but even if they die if if they fall into the water and then drown well for them that's a glorious death because dying by drowning means that they're guaranteed to go to the drowned god's watery halls right so that's um and it's also you know green sea death of course but on a plot wise thing, it's interesting. It's like Victorian just George just continuing to show us this totally strange worldview of the Ironborn. That's all I guess what I'm trying to get at. Like uh he he respected him because he was willing to fight with, you know, in mail at sea. Almost Ironborn, you know, brave going to his death. So yeah, market respect. They gave the captured ship. Go ahead. So he gave the captured ship to Ragnar Pike, named a dozen men to crew her, and clambered back up onto his own iron victory. Strip the captives of arms and armor and have their wounds bound up, he told Newt the barber. Throw the dying in the sea. If any beg for mercy, cut their throats first. He had only contempt for such. Better to drown on seawater than on blood. So I want so, to counter the... Sorry, I mean, you can point... If you want to not get interrupted, Tim, you could stop and point this out. By, I mean, you can see this. Being thrown yeah. into the sea, but first we give them the weird stigmata. Then we throw them into the sea. Like, <laughs> Also, a minute ago, there was burning ships. Burning ships is a weirwood symbol. The ships, the weirwoods are the ships that the green seers use to sail the green sea. 
The weirwoods are burning trees. So we have the burning ships. When are they burning? They're burning after all this weirwood sacrifice. Then the sea was like a stew of corpses. So we've got some weirwood paste in the sea as well as the burning ship symbol. I don't want to get lost on that, but we've covered burning ships extensively in the weirwood compendium. So I just can't go by that without saying something. But go ahead. Uh, I guess I just want to point out, like, also Victorian's just cold pragmatism on this whole thing. Like, have have the ones that are just wounded bound up, and he's doing that because, yeah, if we keep them alive, they're worth, they'll be worth a ransom, they'll be worth something, but throw the dying in the sea. He's not going to waste, he's not going to spend time or maesters or resources on that, so it's just, just straight cold pragmatism on his part in what to do with the survivors. And, and then beyond uh, pragmatism, we see this thing like, oh, if they beg for mercy, cut their throats. Like, um, yeah, it's 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 just this weird belief. Set. It's it's still it is religious, you know, the way that he decides to give people their deaths or not based on if they impress him or earn his respect. Like, it's totally different from Euron. Uh, you know, it's more like Dampere, really, his mindset. And you can see why Damp Hair admires Victorian. Um, even though they're different characters, they both do have a religious adherence to this ironborn moral code, if you will. Yeah. And it's to juxtapose that with Euron, who has no morals, no empathy, no standard, no code of honor or anything like that. Like, Victorian has a weird code of honor and a weird form of empathy it's it's all twisted versions of those but they're there in his in his own weird way he has them okay so i want a count of the ships we won and all the knights and lordlings we took captive i want their banners too one day he would hang them in his hall so when he grew old and feeble he could remember all the foes he had slain when he was young and strong it will be done new grinned it is a great victory I, he thought, a great victory for the crow's eye and his wizards. The other captains would shout his brother's name anew when the tidings reached Oakenshield. Euron had seduced them with his glib tongue and smiling eye and bound them to his cause with the plunder of half a hundred distant lands. Gold and silver, ornate armor, curved swords with gilded pommels, daggers of Valyrian steel, striped tiger pelts and the skins of spotted cats, jade manacores and ancient Valyrian sphinxes, chests of nutmeg, cloves, and saffron, ivory tusks and the horns of unicorns, green and orange and yellow feathers from the summer sea, bolts of fine silk and shimmering samite. And yet all that was little and less compared to this. Now he has given them conquest, and they are his for good and all, the captain thought. The taste was bitter on his tongue. This was my victory, not his. Where was he? Back on Oakenshield, lazing in a castle. He stole my wife and he stole my throne and now he steals my glory. So just for the to point out like here, the saffron and the ivory and all that, like we got to remember, even though saffron, cloves and nutmeg, simple spices, like we might even have those in our own cabinets. But at a time like this, those things are worth more than gold. And the fact that Euron's is willy nilly giving all of that away. Yeah, this is also like the Bloodstone Emperor, if we're just following the sequence of the chapter. And remember, George uses flashbacks to create the necessary symbolic sequence. So we're supposed to follow the ideas and themes right across from the battle to Victorian's reverie. And so after this battle where we've had all this weirwood and this and this a sacrifice, now the crow's eye, the Bloodstone Emperor, is full of gifts. He's sitting in power, he's dictating terms, he is resplendent. He's handing out Valyrian stuff left and right, okay? And all these things from distant lands from the east, like all those spices, those are from the east. Saffron Straits is right by a shy. So you could see the crow's eye and his wizards. So it's a wizard king, a ma magic king. So this all happens right on cue is my point like after the nissanissa sacrifice now we see bloodstone emperor um in power stealing victorian's glory so there is also, this thing with a brother brother rivalry and i don't know if i can get into it enough to make it make sense but 
it's it's the whole king of winter summer king thing where they kill each other to celebrate the turning of the seasons with stannis and renly fight each other in different ways you know stannis's shadow kills renly and then someone dresses up as renly and fights against stannis um all the garths the two of the garths fight each other at craster's keep there's a lot of brother brother stuff so i'm not sure how that ties into the astronomy but nevertheless we see this a lot of times the brother that's it seems like azor high stealing nissa nissa from garth the green a lot of times um rhaegar stealing lyanna from robert stealing of course that's the template um so it's it's because of course nissa nissa being a child of the forest she she belongs to the garth people the garth people are her people um think of uther hightower winning maris the most fair who's a daughter of garth the green that's the same idea uther hightower is the azor high figure he's wedding the daughter of garth so sometimes it's the daughter of garth but other times it's like a brother brother thing there's um Beric, azor high and greenbeard uh, both watching Arya, and when Azor Ahai leaves, Greenbeard takes care of Arya, and and then Barrett comes back and takes her. So there's various things, but it's like if you're taking Nissa Nissa, you're taking her from the Green Men, kind of. So I'm not sure how that fits in with Victarion and Euron, but they are fighting over Danny, right? Like Victarion thinks he's yeah. going to marry Danny, and Euron wants to marry Danny. So it's it's some version of that. Brandon the Breaker, right, uh, defeated Knight's King, who may have been his brother. So that template would make Brandon the Breaker the last hero figure. So anyways, I don't want to get too lost in that, but we do see that brother rivalry a lot of times. So yeah. maybe maybe we'll see it too, developed. I just want to point out too, like all these items that Victarians listed that Euron has been giving as gifts, they're like dots on a map to show all of the places that Euron has been. Like striped tiger pelts, that's that could be Lang, where there's tigers. The, him having unicorn horns, that's like he's been to Skagos, he's been to Ib, the the feathers, he's been to the Summer Isle. So it's just like, yeah, it just goes to show just how well traveled Euron is. Or he's full of shit and he picked this all up at like the markets at base Dothrock, where all these traders meet. So, but I, I just think it's interesting. I, I like to think that he has visited all these places that he is able to sail far and fast and, and be very worldly like that. Yeah. So again, it's just the same patterns of someone coming from afar and being associated with all these foreign magics and powers and knowledge and all that stuff. So uh, Rebecca Weston, great comments today, by the way, Rebecca, I'm trying so hard not to derail. Um, Core babies has a hypothesis about the brother rivalry and it has to do with all along the watchtower. Well, hit me up on Twitter, Rebecca, and uh, we can talk about it. And thanks for the super chat. So, where were we here? Um, back on Oakenshield, blazing in a castle. Yeah. So, Obedience stole King my naturally. wife and stole my throne. This really does fit. Like, he's in Oak Oakenshield. Remember, like, with the whole Summer King Gar thing, Oak is the tree associated with Summer. So Azor Ahai invading the Weirwood Net, he's turning it into what it is now. You know, the, the carved faces and the blood and all that stuff. But it seems to have been uncorrupted and different before then. So the idea of chilling on Oakenshield, lazing in a castle, that means he's invaded the land of the Green Men. That's what Oakenshield represents. And of course, John the Oak, son of Garth the Green, um, Oaken Seat, the gardeners sit on. So... Yeah, it's like taking the oaken seat. It's a similar idea. Stealing his glory. So go ahead. Um, obedience came naturally. I'm going to go get Cleo. I'll be right back. Sure. Obedience came naturally to Victorian Greyjoy. He had been born to it. Growing to manhood in the shadow of his brothers, he had followed Balin dutifully in everything he did. Later, when Balin's sons were born, he had grown to accept that one day he would kneel to them as well when one of them took his father's place upon the sea stone chair. But the drowned god had summoned Balin and his sons down to his watery halls, and Victarion could not call Euron king without tasting bile in his throat. The wind was freshening, and his thirst was raging. After a battle, he always wanted wine. He gave the deck to Newt and went below. 
In his cramped cabin oft, he found the dusky woman wet and ready. Perhaps the battle had warmed her blood as well. He took her twice in quick succession. When they were done, there was blood smeared across her breasts and thighs and belly. But it was his blood from the gash in his palm. The dusky woman washed it out for him with boiled vinegar. The plan was good, I grant him, Victorian said as she knelt beside him. The mander is open to us now as it was of old. It was a lazy river, wide and slow and treacherous with snags and sandbars. Most seagoing vessels dared not sail beyond High Garden, but long ships with their shallow draughts could navigate as far upstream as Bitterbridge. In ancient days, the Ironborn had boldly sailed the river road and plundered all along the mander and its vast Tim. stream. Tim, yep. how could you just go by that? And this and this uh, bloody <laughs> stuff and not even say a thing. You're killing me. I'm just teasing you, giving you a hard time. But of course, you're probably distracted by the like sort of disturbing nature of it. But, um, you know, this is a Nissa Nissa sex scene, essentially. One of the layers of Azor Ahai stabbing Nissa Nissa and creating Lightbringer. One version of that template is them having a special magic child together. So, you know, the moon and the sun are husband and wife and they're having dragon meteor children so the whole thing is a is a childbirth stuff the moon dies in childbirth essentially so the dusky woman and dusk like the dusky woman the night woman the sunset woman nissa means night in arabic it's one of the things that we found Nissa has a lot of meanings i'm not sure which one george is using or all of the above because the nis are elf people in scandinavian folklore <laughs> N-I-S-S-E, the Nis. Um, usually a man, but it's a little elf man. So Nissa means night um, in Arabic, I believe it is. And so here we have dusky woman. And then um, there's blood smeared across her, across her breasts, just like Nissa Nissa was stabbed by Lightbringer. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so the dusky woman, that's Nissa Nissa. And she's got blood on her breast. Uh, there you go. So, very cool. Go ahead. Uh, so, where were you reading now? Uh, uh, the long ship. Uh, yeah, the, talking about the the Mander and its vassal streams. Okay. Uh, until until the kings of the Green Hand, so the gardeners had armed the fisher folk on the four small islands off the Mander's mouth and named them his shields. Okay, so that's creating the others then. Um, as a result of invasion of the sea by the Ironborn. And of course, Ironborn, I should have pointed out, all the moon meteors are Ironborn. Like they're literally pieces of rock born from the moon. So the Ironborn, when they invade, they're like invading meteors. So as a result of them invading the Greenlands, okay, what did they do? It says, uh, the kings of the green hand armed the fisher folk. So they, they made warriors from the sea on, on the shields and the shield islands. So this is the creating of the others to guard the weirwood trees, essentially, by the kings of the green hand as a result of the invasion. That's the same pattern that we've been, we just saw on the battle, right? Where all the Nissa Nissa sacrificed people were also the others. So 2,000 years had passed, but in the Watchtower, oh, so did you say that this has something to do with all along the Watchtower, Rebecca? <laughs> there are Watchtowers all over the... <clears throat> okay, we got to talk on Twitter. This sounds interesting. <laughs> Watchtower, you know I love Jimi Hendrix. Okay, so in the Watchtowers along their craggy shores, Greybeards still kept the ancient vigil. So... A watchtower is an obvious weirwood symbol. It's a tree that you keep watch from. The tree is like a tower. And there's gray beards in there. So we should think of the gray king, especially since this is an ironborn chapter. So the gray king's in the watchtower, keeping their ancient vigil. That's green seers in the weirwood keeping their vigil. At the first glimpse of long ships, the old men would light their beacon fires. So they would... Their watchtowers would turn into burning trees when they are invaded, and the call would leap from hill to hill and island to island. 
Fear, foes, raiders. When the fisher folk saw the fires burning on high places, they would put their nets and plows aside and take up their swords and axes. Their lords would rush from their castles, attended by their knights and men-at-arms. War horns would echo across the waters from green shield to gray shield, oaken shield, south shield, and their longships would come sliding out from moss-covered stone pens along the shores. Oars flashing as they swarmed along the straits to seal the mander and hound and harry the raiders upriver to their doom. Euron had sent Torold Browntooth and the Red Oarsmen up the Mander with a dozen swift long ships so the lords of the shift Shield Islands would spill forth in pursuit. By the time his main fleet arrived, only a handful of fighting men remained to defend the Isles themselves. <laughs> the Ironborn had come in on the evening tide, so the glare of the setting sun would keep them hidden from the Greybeards and the Watchtowers until it was too late. The wind was at their backs, as it had been all the way down from Old Wick, it was whispered about the fleet that Euron's wizard had much and more. Hey, Melisandre, to do with that, the crow's eye appeased the storm god with blood sacrifice. How else would he have dared to sail so far west instead of following the shoreline as was the custom? So sailing west means he sailed out into the sea out of sight of shore, um, which is a different, completely different navigation. But Euron obviously can navigate the open sea um, and maybe using magic as well. So, very cool. Um, yeah, so go ahead. You want to pick up with Ironborn, or do you have comments? Oh, just all of the, again, like, just more of this cementing the fact that Euron is a storm god. Uh, the, uh, the wind was at their backs. Him having these wizards that and seemingly commanding the winds to make this idea happen because it goes so against the norm of what Victorian and normal sailors would do and what the iron would normally do in this kind of situation. Like he said, how else would he dare sail so far to the West instead of following the shorelines of the custom? Well, it's, he's doing it because he has the winds on his side and he can make it happen. <clears throat> the iron... The Ironborn ran their longships up onto the stony shingles and spilled out into the purple dusk with steel glimmering in their hands. By then the fires were burning in the high places, but few remained to take up arms. Gray Shield, Green Shield, and South Shield fell before the sun came up. Oaken Shield lasted half a day longer, and when the, and when the men of the Four Shields broke off their pursuit of Torwald and the Red Oarsmen and turned downriver, they found the Iron Fleet waiting at the Mander's mouth. All fell out as Euron said it would, Victorian told the dusty woman as she bound up his hand with linen. So his mander, wizard... um, we get, it's that word mander being used. Uh, eh. What does it mean? Why do I not remember? This has to do with the weird. So command, summon, the mouth of the mander. Mander means to command, like commander. Um, mm -hmm. to summon. So basically like the mouth of the river, this is like the talk, the mouth of the green sea is a face. It's a commander. So this is the green hand. It's the black gate weirwood face that talks. That's all we're talking about here is the weirwood door concept again, the mouth of the mander. So the ironborn are waiting there. Um, they've, in, they have taken over the mouth of the mander. I think that's that's essentially what's happened. Let's see, where are we? Um, it all fell out as Victorian. Uh, Euron said it would. Victorian told the dusky woman as she bound up his hand with linen. His wizards must have seen it. He had three aboard the silence. Kellen Humble had confided in a whisper. Queer men and terrible they were, but the crow's eye had made them slaves. Uh, he still needs me to fight his battles, though, Victorian insisted. Wiz uh, insisted. Wizards may be well and good, but blood and steel win wars. The vinegar made his wound hurt worse than ever. He shoved the woman away and closed his fist, glowering. Bring me wine. He drank in the darkness, brooding on his brother. Oh, that's, that's a double one. He drank in the darkness, or he drank in the darkness. Shade of the mm. evening is liquid darkness that you could drink. So... Yeah. In a minute, he's going to be offered shade of the evening. And here, he's drinking in the darkness. 
That's cool. Yeah, and Shade of the Evening is the wine of the warlocks and these wizards Victorian is talking about that Euron has made his slaves. These would be the warlocks that he's holding on the silence. Pyat Pri and two of his associates. That is correct. And thank you, Alyssa, for a generous PayPal. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, she is saying that as a lover of mythology, astrology, psychology, and philosophy, your work really gives us something to chew on. She's grateful. So very cool. You're welcome. And... Oh, that's a receipt for my payment to Google. I don't need to read that. <laughs> All right. Uh, what were you, so, yeah, so those are the warlocks on board. You're exactly right. And let me go to a different Victorian. I've been on that one forever. This is Mike Hallstein. Oh, I've got this one, actually. Yeah. He's got the fire hand, so this is ahead of time. But it's a great Victorian. It definitely captures... Like, that's what his face would look like. Like, that's that's not a well-kempt beard, necessarily. <laughs> Anyways. Um, drank in the darkness, brooding on his brother. If I do not strike the blow with mine own hand, am I still a kinslayer? Victorian feared no man, but the drowned god's curse gave him pause. If another strikes him down at my command, will his blood still stain my hands? Aaron Dampere would know the answer, but the priest was somewhere back on the Iron Islands, still hoping to raise the Ironborn against their new crowned king. Newt the barber can shave a man with a thrown axe from twenty yards away, and none of Euron's mongrels could stand against Wolf One Ear, or Andric the Unsmiling. Any of them could do it. But what a man can do and what a man will do are two different things, he knew. Euron's blasphemies will bring down the drowned god's wrath upon us all, Aaron had prophesied back on Old Wick. We must stop him, brother. We are still of Balin's blood, are we not? So is he, Victorian had said. I like it no more than you, but Euron is the king. Your king's moot raised him up, and you put the driftwood crown upon his head yourself. I place the crown upon his head, said the priest, seaweed dripping in his hair, and gladly will I rest it off again and crown you in his stead. Only you are strong enough to fight him. The drowned god raised him up, Victorian complained. Let the drowned god cast him down. You want to pick up here? Aaron gave him a baleful look, the look that had been known to sour wells and make women barren. It was not the god who spoke, Euron is known to keep wizards and foul sorcerers on that red ship of his. They sent some spell among us so we could not hear the sea. The captains and the kings were drunk with all this talk of dragons. So, real so, quick, that's a weird yeah. inversion of Garth. Garth makes the maidens pregnant and ripe and makes the plants bloom. Aaron sours wells <laughs> and makes women barren. That's a very cool inversion of Garth symbolism. And of course, Aaron is like a priest of the others symbolically but you what were you gonna say i was gonna say also this is like air uh w with a sign of aaron's like fanaticism where he's now making excuses for why euron uh became king like victorian says well he the, let, the drowned god made him king and victorian and aaron's like no no it wasn't the drowned god euron he did something and it's like yeah it's it, that's a very religious thing like uh if when you can't explain like well how how could God let this happen or something? It's like, well, no, no, uh, witchcraft, sorcery, you know, that type of thing. So Aaron just looking for excuses as to how his plan could fail and not really looking into it like, well, you know, it, it had nothing to do with any of that. You opened the king's moot. You had to give Euron the right to speak and you kind of brought this on yourself. Uh, Drown God had nothing to do with it. This, this is all your, your, uh, your fault in a way. And it's sort of like the fanaticism that just keeps people from admitting their faults, admitting their mistakes. Rather, they would just double down and say, like, no, no, something went wrong, something corrupted. There's nothing I could have done that went wrong. There's nothing in our faith that's wrong that would have allowed this to happen. Yeah, and... Um, yeah, so, so it's more like sort of corruption of religion. Uranus is invading ironborn culture and literally corrupting their own religion and priesthood so it's just everything about your uh, azor high characters 
you know, it's strongly implied that they're corrupting and twisting the Weirdnet, which is, you know, the real religion that we're talking about here. Then this is another, this is a baleful eye reference the chat is pointing out, uh, Bud Raven, nice job. So that's the Isle of, Eye of Baylor from Irish folklore. We've talked about it many times. All the Night's King characters are associated with Bale concepts, Bale the Bard, Peter Baelish, Baylor the Blessed, Rhaegar that's like Bale, Mance Raider that's like Bale the Bard. Um, so here we have the baleful look is what's withering and like souring the wells and stuff. That's definitely the evil eye right there that we're talking about. Yeah. And that's what Euron's eye is, the evil eye. You know, it's it's the corrupting eye. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, and Carl's bringing up Baal Moloch, the bull god of child sacrifice. So that's just, that's lending me more Taurus credence. Uh, the red star eye is Taurus's eye. And again, and back to the no godless man speech, what is what is Euron specifically mentioned? Goats, bulls, and children. And this is, again, goats, bulls. Uh, the goat Capricorn, the bull Taurus, and Virgo, the virgin maiden, who are the earth signs that all correspond in these occultations. Um, real quick, Guilty Undertaker's mentioning Baylor Breakspear. All around nice guy. Hard to see as a Knight's King figure. But we see the symbolism. First of all, Knight's King could be misunderstood to some extent. That's one thing. Second thing, Baylor Breakspear... Um, he wears somebody else's black armor. And that is probably another instance of Night King wearing John's body like a skin suit. Remember, Lord of Bones claims Corn's bones and then wears Mance Raider's body via a glamour. And this is the repeated pattern of Night's King figure being trapped in the weirwood net but looking for a body to inhabit. Um, so that could be another instance of that, uh, uh, if you, uh, we're going to do Duncan Egg reread, so we'll go back and look at that, but we'll have to see what Ooh. Baylor Breakspear does. I'm sure it's Night King associated, uh, but he does wear somebody else's black armor to go into the fight, so that is like stealing a, a body to use as a skin suit. Yeah, he wears Valar's armor. Oh, Valor. Valar. Valar, like Valor, you know, like the last heroes. Heroic, right? It's full of Valor, so... Interesting, interesting. We'll we'll take that on a different day. Okay, so the captains and the kings were drunk with all this talk of dragons. So drunk, intoxic. Yeah, I'm not sure what. Okay, well, drunk and fearful of that horn. You heard the sound it made. It makes no matter. Euron is our king, not mine. The priest declared. The drowned god helps bold men, not those who cower below their decks when the storm is rising. If you will not bestir yourself to remove the crow's eye from the sea stone chair, I must take the task upon myself. How? You have no ships, no swords. I have my voice, the priest replied, and the god is with me. Mine is the strength of the sea, a strength the crow's eye cannot hope to withstand. The waves may break upon the mountain, yet they still come, wave upon wave, and in the end only pebbles remain where once the mountain stood. So you could turn a moon mountain into a bunch of pebbles, guys. And soon even the pebbles are swept away to be ground beneath the sea for all eternity. Pebbles? Victorian grumbled. You are mad if you think to bring the crow's eye down with talk of waves and pebbles. The ironborn shall be the waves. Remember I just said, the idea of ironborn is like a, a meteor shower. Okay, shower, as in... It's, it's like rain, but they're meteors. So waves, the waves shall be the ironborn. That's waves of meteors. <clears throat> Not the great and lordly, but the simple folk, tillers of the soil and fishers of the sea. The captains and the kings raised Euron up, but the common folk shall tear him down. I shall go to Great Wick, to Harlaw, to Orkmont, to Pike itself. In every town and village shall my words be heard. No godless man may sit the sea stone chair. Oh, that reminds me. That reminds me. Um, yeah, I have it on my Instagram. Somebody drew the three-eyed seagull, Tim. Yeah, oh, I shared I saw it on that. Twitter. Yeah, I'll go to my Instagram page, I, and that's where I know I have it. Yeah, here it is. No godless man may sit the sea stone chair, said the seagull. <laughs> so, 
Well, one thing Aaron's doing here is that's okay. Keep kinda, going, by the way, go ahead. Sorry. <clears throat> oh, it kind of hark when he says he's going to go and preach to the small folk. It's almost like the shepherd in a way from from Fire and Blood. Um, and I know in the description when we get a description of Aaron, even though they describe him as having black hair and him and he is the youngest living brother. Um, I, in my mind's eye, I can't not picture him as like this spindly old man with gray hair. So in my mind's eye, he always looks more like the shepherd. I can't picture him young with black hair. I picture him actually being looking, looking much, much older than his brothers are. So this just, so, and me saying that and then this, like, yeah, it's, it's a lot of shepherd imagery in my opinion. Yeah, it's, he's definitely fucking nuts. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's no doubt about that um yeah and i agree and the shepherd is also against the dragons and so is aaron you know euron is the is the dragon lord wannabe dragon yeah. lord here so it's also uh garston whitebeard he was the one who uh after the bad brother uh killed all his uh opponents at the king's moot garston whitebeard who's like this old old this galen old white man, staff uh, you mean Oh, white staff. Yeah. 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 You're he's the one who just white beard. That's different. I'm um, getting so many names and names that make you remember. But still, he's the one who kind of just went around, just kind of, you know, hitting people with his beating stick. And I've always kind of pictured uh, Aaron as being like the second coming of him and doing the same thing. Like, this is a false king. We need to cast him down. I need to get the small folk to do it. And I'm going to use my power of preach and prayer to do it. We'll see. We'll see. Um, spoiler alert. He did not, in the end, start a rebellion. <laughs> um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, he shook his shaggy head and stalked back out into the night. When the sun came up the next day, Aaron had vanished from Old Wick. Even his drowned men knew not where. They said Crow's Eye only laughed when he was told. Yeah. yeah <laughs> but though the there, priest yeah. was gone, his dire warnings lingered. Victorian found himself remembering Baylor Blacktide's words as well. So Baylor Blacktide, I just said Bale is a Night King name. Baylor Blacktide. The Black Tide is the tide of darkness and the waves of darkness in the sky, waves of bleeding stars. And of course, Baylor Blacktide has a sable cloak, black cloak, that Euron steals from him. So Waymar also has the Black Cloak. He becomes a symbolic Night King at the end of that prologue chapter. So the Black Cloak, important Night King figure. Of course, he was a Night's Watchman too, but it's mainly a symbol of the darkness, just like Euron's Black Sail. So, yeah, Baylor Black Tide. Yeah, that's what that's about. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, yeah. Remembering Baylor Black Tide's words. Balin was mad. Aaron is madder, and Euron is maddest of them all. So, different kinds of mad. Balin is, like, obsessed and hubristic and stubborn. Um, Aaron is religious zealot mad, and Euron is, like, psychopathic and has, like, delusions of grandeur or something like that. Like, he's somebody that's taken too much acid and just doesn't, doesn't have that line of what's real and what's not real solid you know he's a sociopath yeah <laughs> he's a few things psychoanalyzing you're on it's almost hard to do but his whole he's trying to transcend humanity and for him that means you know killing killing any things that we would identify as human traits like empathy or whatever Uh, um, okay, so maddest of them all. Go ahead. The young lord had tried to sail. He tried to sail home after the king's moot, refusing to accept Euron as his liege, but the iron fleet had closed the bay. The habit of obedience was rooted deep in Victorian Greyjoy, and Euron wore the driftwood crown. Nightflyer was seized. Lord Blacktide delivered to the king in chains. Euron's mutes and mongrels had him cut into seven parts to feed the seven Greenland gods he worshipped. As a result for his leal service, the new crown king had given Victorian the dusky woman, taken off some slaver bound for release. I want none of your leavings, he had told his brother scornfully, 
But when the crow's eye said that the woman would be killed unless he took her, he had weakened. So there's like that, again, that little, that little bit of empathy that Victorian has. And he saw the dusky woman and more than likely saw uh, the wife that he had murdered in that moment. And that's why he falters and says, okay, fine, I'll take her. Because he doesn't want her, not if you're going to kill her. Uh, her and tongue had been... Yeah. Also, um, being fed to the green lands... So the black tide, where does it flood? The green lands, like the green lands are flooded with darkness. And who did it? You're on. <laughs> so, yeah. go ahead. And also, this is the this is the second lord now that Euron has had Iron Island lord that Euron's had killed since coming home because uh, this is after he's also killed uh, Lord Botley, drowning him in a cask of seawater. So he's just <laughs> the new the new king of the Iron Island is. is pretty good at taking care of his own lords at this point. Uh, he had weakened. Her tongue had been torn out, but elsewise she was undamaged and beautiful besides, with skin as brown as oiled teak. Yet sometimes when he looked at her, he found himself remembering the first woman his brother had given him to make a man of him. Victorian wanted to use the dusky woman once again, but found himself unable. Fetch me another skin of wine, he told her, then get out. When she returned with a skin of sour red, the captain took it up on deck where he could breathe the clean sea air. He drank half the skin and poured the rest into the sea for all the men who died. Got to pour one out for the homies. Love that. <laughs> Living in a gangster's paradise. Yeah, that's, and that's, also, that's yeah. And a skin of sour red, it also seems a, a bit like blood drinking. Blood kind of has like that metallic taste to it. So well, yeah. sour red. Uh, yeah. Red wine is always blood. And and we're pouring it into the sea. That's just more of the same idea. Like it's sacrificing into literally feeding the weirwood's blood. Just like when Bran can taste the blood that's shed to the weirwood. So that's what's going on. Um, Dusky woman, obviously Nissa Nissa. The tongue torn out silencing is an important symbolism. We see it with Stoneheart. We see it with um, thistle. It's a very common symbol. It's going into the weirwood symbol because it gives you the bloody mouth and the weirwoods are silent. But it also has to do with like Nissa Nissa's agency being taken from her, um, which she seems to get back as Night's Queen potentially. Um, or just as, uh, as the hangwoman, if we're talking about the Red Comet, coming back and killing people. So... What's so Victorian has the dusky woman with him. That's mm -hmm. basically like Azor and Nissa, Nissa in the weirwood net. He, t he keeps her with, with him all during his voyage. Um, but what's going on with her? Like, wh what do you think is going on with the dusky woman? And take that dusky woman and take that any way you want to, like as a plot inclusion, why is she there? probably something having to do with building on that theme of Euron, I mean, Victorian and his wives and stuff like that, like you said, reminds him of his first wife. It's a way that yeah. Euron's tormenting him. Yeah, it is like one, it is Euron playing on Victorian's weaknesses, especially when it comes to women. Um, the second is, like I said, Euron's gifts are poisoned. Um, and he even says like, I'm not going to take your leaving. So chances are one that Euron has also been physically involved with the dusky woman but also that she might be his spy um and that his gifts are poisoned so maybe she is poisoning him along the way um her boiling just like how it's kind of like how miri mazdor says that she's going to heal call drogo but then we see what really happens well the dusky woman um here in this chapter boil uh treating his hand with boiled vinegar but we don't know. We don't know if that's actually boiled vinegar. We don't know. We're only getting that from Victorian's perspective, and Victorian's not the sharpest tool in the shed, so we can't be for sure exactly what she's pouring onto his hand. It's um, pretty water. It, it's pretty yeah. water. It's, let's, let's not kid around. No, you're exactly. It's a good comparison to Miriam Asdor. Miriam Asdor, her name, by the way, is an allusion to Durga, who is a form of Kali, so a, a goddess of well, a lot of things, but, um, and then also Miri Mazdur is mirror maze door possibly, uh, with the whole idea of the weird net being a maze, Nissa Nissa being a door that Azor Ahai uses to get in there. Miri Mazdur, I think 
is the maze door. And that's that's what Nissa Nissa is. She's the way into the Weird Net maze. But also takes him prisoner, corrupts him, takes him down, and traps him, whatever. We see that as well. So that would make sense if the Dusky Woman was poisoning Vic. Um, that would make sense. I wonder why Makoro didn't suss that out, though. Because he sussed out that the maester was no good. Yeah. Um, well, I did. I did read a theory um, where someone has suggested when because when Makoro shows up and the dusky woman hisses at him, um, there was a theory that Makoro uh, probably might have done the same thing Miri Mazdor did and used the dusky woman in the sacrifice. So the idea is that Victorian has been having sex with the dusky woman every chance he gets. That he might have had that he's might have impregnated her along the way, and when the dusky woman sees Makoro, the reason she hisses is because she knows what Makoro is going to do and what the cost of this treatment he's going to give Victorian is. Hmm. Which so is it's, what? It's, 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 that he that uh, he's going to require some kind of blood sacrifice. And just how Miri Mazdor had tricked Danny into thinking that Call Drogo's horse would be the price to pay, but really it was her unborn child, mm. that maybe the dusky woman has such a visceral reaction to Makoro, because if she's carrying Victorian's child along on the sea voyage after all the times they've been physically mm. intimate, oh. that she she might be the thing that's going to be the price that Makoro pays. And it's something that Victorian is, it's, it's a price Victorian would be willing to pay. He, uh, well, a ba- would... yeah, go ahead. A bastard son, a bastard son to save him, to save himself. And then especially too, after the surgery happens again, the, the change in perspective, how it no longer seems like Victorian's even the one in control. Again, it seems like a, a some kind of price was paid for that, for that, and whether it be uh, an unborn child of Victorian or Victorian's own own sense of self, with that perspective shift, maybe the dusky woman knew. It's like, yo, y- I can't talk, so I can't tell you, but uh, you're going to be paying a humongous price for this surgery he's about to give you. And of course, um, Nissa Nissa is sacrificed by Azor High so he can gain power and magic. That's the whole point of why he's a bad guy <laughs> and why we have to reinterpret that story. So if if Makoro, the Red Priest, is like, yeah, Vic, we got to take your Nissa Nissa dusky woman figure and use her as a sacrifice in order to really get good magic going here, that would just mm-hmm. be very according to pattern. So that makes a lot of yeah, sense. We don't... Yeah, because once after Makoro and Victarian... Uh, go to Victorian's room and the door is closed. We hear the singing and the wailing and the monkey shrieking. But before that all happens, we don't know what words were exchanged between them behind closed doors. And then again, when Victorian emerges, when the door opens back up and Victorian steps out, again, we have this sudden shift in our point of view, the way the chapter, the way the rest of the chapter is written. <clears throat> yeah. And, um, Let's see. Um, okay, uh, interesting thought, Rebecca. I'm not going to read that because I'll get too off of <laughs> off track. But that's an interesting one about hissing. Um, yeah, Nissa, Nissa, and hissing. Of course, all that screaming is Nissa, Nissa's scream. We've seen the screaming in the battle, and the screaming during that hand thing is will be the same same symbol. Um, the monkeys leaping off the boat might be the moon meteors leaping off the moon, actually. Uh, now that I think about it, that's pretty funny. Or the children of the forest being driven out, the green seers being driven out of the weirwood net. Um, mm-hmm. Same same idea, but... yeah. Um, okay, so... Because that, that really is the same. Like, Azor High invades the moon, the moon meteors get kicked out. Um, and so that's the template for the others as well. Okay, so the Iron Victory lingered for hours off the mouth of the Mander. As the greater part of the Iron Fleet got underway for Oakenshield, Victorian kept Grief, Lord Dagon, Iron Wind, and Maiden's Bane around him as a rear guard. <clears throat> they pulled survivors from the seas and watched Hard Hand sink slowly, dragged under by the wreck that she had rammed. Those, the ship's names always have meaning. 
Grief, Lord Dagon, Iron Wind, Maiden's Bane. Iron Wind is more meteor storm talk, obviously. Maiden's Bane, you know, Nissa Nissa is the maiden. Um, hard Hand, that's the hand of a white, but, uh, you know, dragged under by the wreck that she had rammed. I'm not sure what that means. By the time she had vanished beneath the waters, Victorian had the count he'd asked for. He had lost six ships and captured eight and thirty. It will serve, he told Newt. To the oars. We return to Lord Hewitt's town. Go ahead. <clears throat> if you would. His oarsmen bent their backs toward Oakenshield, and the Iron Captain went below decks once again. I could kill him, he told the dusky woman, though it is a great sin to kill your king, and a worse one to kill your brother. He frowned. Asha should have given me her voice. How could she have ever hoped to win the captains of the kings, her with her pine cones and her turnips? Balin's blood is in her, but she is still a woman. She had run after the king's moot. The night the driftwood crown was placed on Euron's head, she and her crew had melted away. Some small part of Victorian was glad she had. If the girl keeps her wits about her, she will wed some northern lord and live with him in his castle, far from the sea in Euron Crow's Eye. Oh, it's, I want that one point here. So, like, this him, Asha with her pine cones and her turnips, and uh, even going back to his converse, his last conversation with Aaron, it really just goes to show, like, um, symbolism and metaphor is not Victorian's forte. He is a very literal person. <laughs> You're mute. <laughs> mute. I was saying, yeah, famously that Dothraki Sea thing threw him off pretty hard, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so that's why Victorian chapters are, are so fun to read, because he's so blunt. And he says exactly what he's thinking, no matter what. So you get some of these great moments. Um, and what 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 trips me up about him is the way in the later chapters, like in A Dance with Dragons, like Victorian actually thinks that he's like some kind of abolitionist. Uh, after he sacrifices the yeah, the, seven, you're right. the seven women he tells the rest of the sex workers well now he gives them to his captains and says you only have to serve one man instead of many uh the slave boys he's like you're no longer slaves you're now oarsmen for the iron fleet like he he sees no difference between thraldom and slavery he thinks he's actually doing good and freeing people and he thinks that this is all going to impress danny when he gets to marine like victorian Greyjoy, the freer of slaves the breaker of chains it's, no you just put them in new chains and put them on your own ships to steer your own boats yeah it's that is pretty funny um monologue you know that that whole yeah i mean victorian's inner monologue is endlessly entertaining there's no doubt about that that's the that's the bonus with reading his chapters it's like why did george give us the ironborn chapters through vic's pov well it's just a lot of fun mm -hmm. um so go ahead and pick up again and see um oh asha with her pine cones so that's nissa nissa with her like being like a tree she has pine cones um Let's see. She had run from the king's moot. They had melted away when Euron became king. So that's more Nissa Nissa turning into the others. Okay. Nissa, her men, her, Nissa Nissa's men, her crew, those would be other green men. So they melted away. They turned into the others when a crown was placed on Euron's head. Some small part of Vic was glad. If the girl keeps her wits about her, she will red, wed some northern lord and live with him in his castle. Far from the sea and you're on crow's eye. So yeah, Nissa Nissa should go really wed like a Stark or something, you know, like a Northern Lord, maybe like Night's King, you know, who might be a Stark. Anyway, Lord Hewitt's town, Lord Captain, a crewman called. Victorian rose. The wine had dulled the throbbing in his hand. Perhaps he would have Hewitt's maester look at it if the man had not been killed. He returned to deck as they came around a headland. The way Lord Hewitt's castle sat above the harbor reminded him of Lord's Port though this town was twice as big. A score of longships prowled the waters beyond the port, the golden kraken writhing on their sails. Hundreds more were beached along the sink, uh, shingles and drawn up to the piers that lined the harbor. At a stone quay stood three great cogs and a dozen smaller ones, taking on plunder and provisions. Victorian gave orders for the Iron Victory to drop anchor. Boy, all those boat words just put my brain to sleep i i can't that was hard to read 
Something about quays and piers and the key, not the quay, the key, the stone key. I said it again. I said quay. That's the key. A stone key stood three great cogs. There's boats and stuff, guys. I see a ship in the harbor. Do 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 do. That's all. That's yeah. all I could say about that. Yeah. How many how many synonym buns can we fit in this oven? Yeah. The town <laughs> seemed strangely still as they approached. Most of the shops and houses had been looted as their smashed doors and broken shutters testified, but only the sept had been put to the torch. The streets were strewn with corpses, each with a small flock of carrion crows in attendance. That's interesting. Corpses with crows in attendance? That sounds like a, some sort of Night's Watch battle. A gang of sullen survivors moved amongst them, chasing off the black birds and tossing the dead into the back of a wagon for burial. The notion filled Victorian with disgust. No true son of the sea would want to rot beneath the ground. How would he ever find the drowned god's watery halls to drink and feast for all eternity? Existential questions of the Ironborn. Go ahead with the silence. The silence was amongst the ships they passed. Victorian's gaze was drawn to the iron figurehead at her prow, the mouthless maiden with the wind-blown hair and outstretched arm. Her mother of pearl eyes seemed to follow him. She had a mouth like any other woman till the crow's eye sewed it shut. As they neared the shore, he noticed a line of women and children herded up onto the deck of one of the great cogs. Some had their hands bound behind their backs and all wore loops of hempen rope about their necks. Who are they? He asked the men who helped tie up their boat. Widows and orphans. They're to be sold as slaves. Sold? There were no slaves in the Iron Islands, only thralls. A thrall was bound to service, but he was not chattel. His children were born free, so long as they were given to the drowned god. And thralls were never bought nor sold for gold. A man paid the iron price for thralls, or else had none. They should be thralls, or salt wives, Victorian complained. It's by the king's decree, the man said. The strong have always taken from the weak, said Newt the barber. Thralls are slaves, it makes no matter. Their men cannot defend them, so now they are ours to do with as we will. It is not the old way, he might have said, but there was no time. His victory had preceded him, and men were gathering round to offer congratulations. Victorian let them fawn until one began to praise Euron's daring. It hang is on, daring to see... Yep. I just want to point out, it is not the old way. This is more clues that Azor High has changed the Weirwoods the green seer magic everything was different before him you know we see that with the azor high figure so you're on getting rid of the old way defiling the old religions and customs superseding them that's what we're talking about with the weird net azor high set it on fire modified it etc cetera, etc cetera. um i think the face carving is not original i think that's an azor high thing post long night and not before so like that little bit there. Uh, go ahead. It is not the old way. It is daring to sail out of sight of land so no word of our coming could reach these islands before us, he growled. But crossing half the world to hunt for dragons, that is something else. He did not wait for a reply, but shouldered through the press and on up to the keep. Lord Hewitt's castle was small but strong with thick walls and studded oaken gates that evoked his house's ancient arms. An oak escutcheon studded with iron upon a field of undy blue and white. But it was the kraken of House Greyjoy that flew atop his green roof towers now, and they found the great gates burned and broken. On the ramparts walked Ironborn with spears and axes, and some of Euron's mongrels too. In the yard, Victorian came on Gorald Goodbrother and Old Drum, speaking quietly with Roderick Harlaw. Newt the Barber gave a hoot at the sight of them. Reader, he called out, why is your face so long? Your misgivings were for naught. The day is ours, and ours the prize. Lord Roderick's mouth puckered. These rocks, you mean? All four together wouldn't make Harlaw. We have won some stones and trees and trinkets, an enmity of House Tyrell. The roses, Newt laughed. What rose can harm the krakens of the deep? We have taken their shields from them and smashed them all to pieces. Who will protect them now? High Garden, replied the reader. Soon enough, all the power of the reach will be marshaled against us, Barber, and then you may learn that some roses have steel thorns. Drum nodded, one hand on the hilt of his red rein. 
Lord Tarly bears the great sword Heartsbane, forged of Valyrian steel, and his is always in Lord Tyrell's van. Victarion's hunger flared. Let him come. I will take his sword for mine own, as for your own forebear took red rain. Let them all come, and bring the Lannisters as well. A lion may be fierce enough on land, but at sea the Krakens rule supreme. He would give half his teeth for the chance to try his axe against the Kingslayer or the Knight of Flowers. That was the sort of battle that he understood. The Kinslayer was accursed in the eyes of gods and men, but the warrior was honored and revered. Okay, so this I want to talk about. um, Because this is a... It's actually a Tony Teflon theory. And it's one that I really, really like. Um, And it's the idea that Victarion, he's looking to cross like a big name off his list. Now, sell, uh, sell me that or lord sari that he killed that he threw over the edge like that's not a big name that's not a name the singers are going to sing and remember but to kill or to fight and kill someone like uh like jamie lannister um that that's a name that's something's gonna remember people are gonna remember that and they're gonna remember the man who killed him and there's this scene later on in the bear and sir barristan who's also a big name uh, Sir Barristan has this internal monologue when he's fighting uh, the one Marine pit fighter, and he has this internal monologue about the difference between fighting uh, a man in armor versus fighting a man without. So this is a man without armor, but Victorian is always in armor. And so the idea is that Barristan is actually going to be killed by Victorian because Victorian is looking to cross a huge name off of his list, something that he'll be remembered for. So yeah, that, that that's just a Tony Teflon theory, and I want to give credit to him because it, it's a I, I like the idea. I think that I could see that being Barristan's end, and because once once uh, all these characters that are on the way to Marine get there, uh, he I feel like it's going to be such a huge hodgepodge. It's going to become time to start calling some of these POV chapters. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have too many characters in one place, and that's how I can see Barristan exiting the story that way. Well, I, my whole thing is that I'm requesting from George a little bit of, I need at least one scene with Barristan, Tyrion, and Victorian mm-hmm. talking and on their three different levels of intelligence. <laughs> like it's, I just, I, I got, I need one scene with those three together, and then we can start killing people off. But that's that's an interesting theory. And shout out to Tony Teflon, of course, if you don't know, most people know, but check out Teflon TV. Um, so I just go back to the shields, the weirwood, like I said, weirwoods are a door and a barrier. So they're also a shield. So we've got all these shields being smashed in this chapter. The shield islands themselves have been taken over. So that's, that's more like, especially when we talk about the mouth of the Mander and all this entrance to the weirwood net stuff. Think of the night for it and the black gate here. For sure. Like the barrier itself is being taken over. Night's King reigned on the wall at the night fort. Um, possibly even before the wall, in my opinion. But that's kind of the thing here. Taking over the shields, taking over the mouth of the Mander. It's the same idea. So let's see here. Um, talking about trinkets, High Garden, um, Tarly, Heartsbane. Victorian wants to take the sword. Heartsbane. Um, let's see here. Let them all come. Yeah, this is mostly just regular plot stuff here. Um, Have no fear, Lord Captain, said the reader. They will come. His grace desires it. Why else would he have commanded us to let Hewitt's ravens fly? And that's talking about all the enemies that Victorian wants to kill. <laughs> You read too much and fight too little, Nude said. Your blood is milk. But the reader made as if he had not heard. Will Jon Snow kill Euron and take his armor? Yeah, I, th- well, I mean, he does need to wear that armor. So I'm going to say yes, Kelly. I'm going to say yes. So blood is milk. That's an others reference. They're, you know, they've got blue blood, but their skin is like milk. So milk blood also that makes you think of the milk water river which freezes. Uh, so I think that's would be another symbol. And the reader 
also that's that's a green seer thing. So I'm not sure about Roderick the Reader. I haven't thought about him too much, but just pointing out milk blood, that's interesting. So a riotous feast was in progress when Victorian entered the hall. Ironborn filled the tables, drinking and shouting and jostling each other, boasting of the men they had slain, the deeds they had done, the prizes they had won. Many were bedecked with plunder. Left hand Lucas Cod and Kellen Humble had torn tapestries off the walls to serve as cloaks. <clears throat> Ah, oh, the tapestries. What's that about? There's the silver seaweed tapestries of the Grey King. It's some sort of skin cloak thing. I'm not sure. Jeremy Botley wore a rope of pearls, okay, and garnets over his gilded Lannister breastplate. Endric the Unsmiling staggered by with a woman under each arm, though he remained unsmiling. Um, he had rings on every finger. Instead of trenchers carved from old stale bread, the captains were eating off solver, solid silver platters. Newt the Barber's face grew dark with anger as he looked about. The crow's eye sends us forced to face the longships, whilst his own men take the castles and the villages and grab all the loot and women. What has he left for us? We have the glory. Glory is good, said Newt, but gold is better. Victorian shrugged. The crow's eye says we shall have all of Westeros, the arbor, Old Town, High Garden. That's where you'll find your gold. But enough talk, I'm hungry. By right of blood, Victorian might have claimed a seat on the dais, but he did not care to eat with Euron and his creatures. Instead, he chose a place by Raft uh, Raff the Limper, captain, uh, uh, the captain of Lord Quellen. A great victory, Lord Captain, said the Limper. A victory worthy of a lordship. You should have an island. Lord Victorian, I and why not? It might not be the sea stone chair, but it would be something. Hotho Harlaw was across the table, sucking meat off a bone. He flicked it aside and hunched forward. The knight's to have Grey Shield. My cousin, did you hear? No. Victorian looked across the hall to where Sir Harms Harlaw. Is it supposed to be Harris? Yeah, Harris Harlaw sat drinking wine. It says Harms in my Kindle. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. I'm. Uh, I'm reading from a different thing, but yeah, your and yours harms is literally like someone read the word Harris but misread it, and yeah. then, anyways, that's a, that's the second time since we've done this. Yours has had a typo, and mine hasn't. Yeah, yeah, that's weird. Uh, so Harms Harlaw, we're gonna call him, sat drinking wine from a golden cup. A tall man, long faced and austere. Why would Euron give that one an island? Hotho held out his empty wine cup, and a pale young woman in a gown of blue velvet and gilt lace refilled it for him. The knight took Grimston by himself. He planted his standard beneath the castle and defied the Grims to face him. One did, and then another, and another. He slew them all. Well, near enough. Two yielded. When the seventh man went down, Lord Grim Septon decided the gods had spoken and surrendered the castle. Hotho laughed. He'll be the lord of Greyshield and welcome to it. With him gone, I am the reader's heir. He thumped his wine cup against his chest. Hotho the humpback, lord of Harlaw. Seven, you say? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I just want to point out, okay, because I, I looked into this, and this is Euron playing politics here, where he's giving the Shield Islands to uh, to his opponents. Um, Harris Harlaw is the Knight of Harlaw. He's the one who wields the Valyrian sword Nightfall. Um, he is Roderick the Reader's cousin, but he is also his heir because Roderick the Reader has no heirs of his own. All of his ch his children have all passed. But you're so he's he's supposed to inherit ten towers from Roderick. But Euron has just given him one of the Shield Islands, so that puts him in debt to Euron. But what is, he is the heir to Roderick, who is one of Euron's opponents. And then this also then puts Hotho the Humpback into debt to Euron because if. Harris is to take the shield, the shield island. Then that means ten towers should go to him. So this is again, this is just Euron playing politics. Um, it also goes back another thing. Uh, Euron's very first supporter was uh, Walden Wench. Wench is the house with the bloody moon on the purple backdrop. Um, and so Walden Wench is Euron's very first supporter. After Euron kills Lord Botley when drowning him, he gives half of the he gives half of the botley lands to the wenches and then the other half he gives to Christopher botley's uncle Christopher botley claims that he is the 
heir to the Botley lands after his father has died, but instead the remaining Botley lands are given to his uncle, a second son who stands to inherit nothing uh, after he lends his support to Euron. So what is he? He is a second son who's who pledges his allegiance to the man who just killed his brother in exchange for some scraps. Yeah, it really is good um, politicking. And Victorian starts to even figure it out um, during the chapter. So, yeah, it is. Um, poison gifts, meaning like all these gifts come with expectations and Euron's agenda is not necessarily yours. So, yeah, um, g thanks for the extra insight there. And then also the yeah. seven champions is interesting. Um you know, because the defenders of these shield islands are the old graybeards, um, the children of the forest who create the others to defend against them. And so it's like you defeated seven champions. That seems like another Waymar. Um, what's what's the young guy's name who beat all seven? Harris Harlow. Oh, he oh, it was all. Harris Harlow that did that. Yeah, Harris the, the with knight, Red Rain. Um, okay. Yeah, the knight of yeah, and the knight took Grimston. And uh, Harris Harlaw is the he's the knight of Grey Garden in the Iron Islands because uh, he's from a cadet branch of House Harlaw. Uh, the main branch is Roderick the Reader and Ten Towers, and then the cadet branch has Grey Garden. That's cool. So the Grey Garden, that's more like Stone Tree, the uh, Naga's ribs you know, dead weirwood language. Interesting. Yeah. Grey Garden. And the whole thing is, though, is because how Euron's gifts are poisoned is because Euron's giving, he's naming people uh, that were opposed to him being king as the as the she, as the Lords of the Shields. Hey, Damon. Um, but he has, and this is how the gifts are poisoned. Euron has no intention of helping these guys. He names them Lord. But he's not going to give them any men or any resources. They're essentially lord in name only. But what matters to them is the title. So he's buying them. He's bought now buying their support, these men who once opposed him or the heirs of men who opposed him, like in the case with the reader. But he's, yeah, but but it's all it's all a front. It's all a fake. Uh, as soon as Euron and the rest of the Ironborn leave, they're sitting ducks. They have no way of actually holding these lands. Mute. So another uh, another poisoned gift in another sense to that, yeah. yeah. Cool. So yeah, Grey Garden. So it's a knight of the Grey Garden who has a red Valerian steel sword. He defeats seven champions. So that sounds like a last hero figure. Um, Harlaw means a mound or hill associated with an army. And Harris means goes back to the son of Harry, and Harry means to Harry is into attack or harass. So, an army hill that attacks, you know, the hills are important because they're associated with the Weirwood Caves, like Winterfell, like the Knights of the Hollow Hill. So that's basically what he is. He's a, a great. Um, what was? Yeah. So he's a, he's a. A knight that comes out of a hill associated with a gray garden with a with a red rain sword. Cool, cool, cool. So <clears throat> seven, you say. Victorian wondered how Nightfall would fare against his axe. He had never fought a man with armed with a Valerian steel blade, though it, though he had thrashed young Harris Harlaw many a time when both of them were young. As a boy, Harlaw had been fast friends with Balin's eldest son, Roderick, who had died beneath the walls of Seaguard. The feast was good. The wine was of the best, and there was roast ox, rare and bloody, and stuffed duck as well, and bucks, fret, crabs, serving much, or pull, velvets, Lord Captain. Blah, 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 blah. He took them for scullions dressed up in the clothes of Lady Hewitt and her ladies until Hotho told him they were Lady Hewitt and her ladies. It amused the crow's eye to make them wait and pour. What does Hewitt mean? Accessibility shortcuts. No. <laughs> intellect house hewitt uh intellect so that's 
these are the ladies that guard the intellect, the mind. So it's a hive mind, weirwood, the mind of the old gods, the repository of knowledge in the weirwood trees. So Hewitt is, which, which shield island is this? <clears throat> Gray shield. Yeah, and notice also that um, Harris Harlaw, um, the knight of Grey Garden, is now going to be the lord of Grey Shield. So the same idea, the Grey Garden and the Grey Shield. This is both weirwood stone, stone weirwood dead tree talk. And so then, yeah, so Lady Hewitt, Lady oh, Hewitt is Oaken Shield. What's that? Hewitt is Oaken Shield. Hewitt is Oaken Shield. So it was Harlaw at the Seven Champions at Grey Shield. So Hewitt is Oaken Shield, right? So these are the ladies of the oak tree that guard the, you know, their intellect ladies. They're 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 wise ladies, I guess you might say. It's probably the best. Like Norns, like the children of the forest are wise old. What does Brand say? The wise little people. So they shouldn't be called children. They're more like wise little people, or I don't know what he said, but yeah, something like that. Um, also, Hugh is to cut down. Right. So that brings us back to the cutting down trees. Hugh it. So to cut it, Hugh it. That's cool. So Oaken Shield represents a tree that's cut down as Azor Ahai's army invades. And then we see the maidens turned in. They're turned into slaves. They're put in bondage, essentially. There were eight of them, her ladyship herself, still handsome, though grown somewhat stout, and seven younger women, aged from 25 to 10, her daughters and good daughters. So there's your seven maidens again, probably. Lord Hewitt himself sat in his accustomed place under the dais, dressed in all his heraldic finery. His arms and legs had been tied to the chair, and a huge white radish shoved between his teeth so he could not speak, though he could see and hear. <clears throat> the crow's eye had claimed a place of honor at his lordship's right hand, a pretty buxom girl of 17 or 18 was in his lap, barefoot and disheveled, her arms around his neck. Who is that? Victorian asked the men around him. His lordship's bastard daughter, laughed Hotho. Before Euron took the castle, she was made to wait at table on the rest and take her own meals with the servants. Euron put his blue lips to her throat, and the girl giggled and whispered something in his ear. Oh, we need the lusty Euron artwork. Where is it? Hmm. We're not quite to the scene yet, but let's let's get everyone's that's, blood pumping. But that is a that's more Euron vampire imagery, putting his blue lips to her throat, and that it's like she's like mesmerized, like she becomes uh, a familiar. Yeah, a vampire's servant would be a familiar. Yes, you're right. It's very vampiric, and the others are very vampiric. They're remember the the undying who represent the others. They're cold blue shadows. They're biting and sucking at Danny as well vampire style so yes there's a lot of vampire symbolism with the others um so you're on okay girl giggled um smiling he kissed her throat again her white skin was covered with red marks where his <laughs> mouth had been um they made a rosy necklace about her neck and shoulders so we've got dappling we've got the red necklace just like we saw with corn's throat it was a necklace of uh, red rubies red ruby tears so we got a rosy necklace here also this ties back into all the people of the rose from sari that were playing the weirwood and nissanissa role here we have this maiden been taken by euron and she has a rosy necklace so and by the way this also has to do with that prologue chapter of feast with pate lusting after rosy um i'll break that down one time that's a great chapter uh, but okay so another whisper in her ear and this time the crow's eye laughed out loud in his ear then slammed his wine cup down for silence good ladies he called out to his highborn serving women Philia is concerned for your fine gowns she would not have them stained with grease and wine and dirty groping fingers since I have promised that she may choose her own clothes from your wardrobes after the feast so you had best disrobe <clears throat> a roar of laughter. I should let you read. I've been reading. Go ahead. Come here, girl. Right, a roar of laughter washed over the great hall, and Lord Hewitt's face turned so red that Victorian thought his head might burst. 
The woman, the women had no choice but to obey. The youngest one cried a little, but her mother comforted her and helped undo the laces down her back. Afterward, they continued to serve as before, moving along the tables with flagons full of wine to each empty cup, only now they did so naked. He shames Hewitt as he once shamed me, the captain thought, remembering how his wife had sobbed as he was beating her. The men of the four shields oft married one another, he knew, just as the Ironborn did. One of these naked serving wenches might well be Sir Talbert Sari's wife. It was one thing to kill a foe, another to dishonor him. Victorian made a fist. His hand was bloody where his wound had soaked through the linen. So if Victorian is the meteor and his hand is bloody, so here we have is more red comet imagery. On the dais, Euron pushed aside oh, his slider. Oh, and what does he constantly think about? Smashing Euron's face Euron's with his male face. fist and Euron is the moon. So yeah, there it is. Yeah. And again, and that is why Euron psychologically abuses Victorian rather than actually physically fights him. Victorian will, would mess him up given the chance. So Euron has to abuse him in other ways. Steel won't protect him. Um, so on the dais, Euron pushed aside his slattern and climbed upon the table. The captains began to bang their cups and stamp their feet upon the floor. Euron, they shouted. Euron, Euron, Euron. It was King's Moot come again. I swore to give you Westeros, the crows, I said, when the tumult died away. And here is your first taste. A morsel, nothing more, but we shall feast before the fall of night. The torches along the walls were burning bright, and so was he, blue lips, blue eye, and all. What the, craspit, what the cracking grasps is, does not loose. These isles were once ours, and now they are again, but we need strong men to hold them. So rise, Sir Harris Harlaw, Lord of Greyshield. The knight stood, one hand upon Nightfall's moonstone pommel. Rise, Andric the Unsmiling, Lord of Southshield. Andric shoved away his women and lurched to his feet like a mountain rising sudden from the sea. Rise, Marin Valmark, Lord of Greenshield, a beardless boy of six and ten years. Valmark stood hesitantly, looking like the Lord of Rabbits. And rise, Newt the Barber, Lord of Oakenshield. Newt's eyes grew wary, as if he feared he was the butt of some cruel jape. A, a lord, he croaked. Victorian had expected the crow's eye to give the lordships to his own creatures, Stonehand and the Red Oarsman and left-hand Lucas Cod. A king must needs be open-handed, he tried to tell himself. But another voice whispered, Euron gifts are poisoned. When he turned it over in his head, he saw it plain. The knight was the reader's chosen heir, and Andric the unsmiling, the strong right arm of Dunstan Drum. Valmark is a callow boy, but he has Black Heron's blood in him through his mother and the barber. Victorian grabbed him by the forearm. Refuse him! Newt looked, as it, looked at him as if he had gone mad. Refuse him? Lands and lordship? Will you make me a lord? He wrenched his arm away and stood, basking in the cheers. And now he steals my men away, Victorian thought. So yeah, so up until this point, when we think of Newt and the way he's been with Victorian palling around. It's almost like Newt's like Victorian's best friend, you know? And now Euron has taken him. So it's like, yeah, Victorian uh Euron takes the things from, takes things from Victorian. He takes his takes his honor, takes his glory, took his wife. Now he takes takes his men and is and again, not just his men, but like yeah, seemingly his best friend. Probably the best friend he's had for years. And then the the counterpoint, the reason why he's doing that is because not only does that isolate Victorian, but then it makes mm -hmm. it so like the only person that Victor the Victorian could think to try to get those things back from is Euron. He's the one who has all the shit because he took all the shit. So in the after we're gonna see in just a minute, after Victorian has been isolated by Euron, now Euron is going to dangles a prize in front of Victorian's face. So he's made him desperate enough to take it, essentially. Um, yeah. And then also there's that Lord of Rabbits line they talk about uh, with the kid who descends from Black Heron. And that's sort of like putting on horns, in a sense, uh, putting on ears on someone. It just is to show, is to like more make a fool out of them. Uh, 
Euron, for his part, is giving this kid this this island, and he's thinking long game because Black Heron. Yeah, it's a famous name, and it's so far removed since Heron the Black and the Doom of Heron Hall. But again, it's another another name that ha- that could have a claim to the Sea Stone Chair to the, to be king of the Iron Throne. So he's also isolating Victorian's men, but he's also he's also trying to remove like old old blood, like old kings, kings that were not Greyjoys, and trying to remove them from from the rankings as well. Volmarks are my favorite because, of course, all the Black Leviathan symbolism. And they were slain mm-hmm. by, uh, you know, the, there was a famous Volmark slain by Aegon the Conqueror with Black Fire. So that was cool. Um, yeah, so. So it's like Euron knows his politics and he knows his histories here by by naming this kid as a lord. Yep. Yep, he's he's working the angles here. Um, and like I said, isolating Vic so that Euron can make him do what he wants. So mm-hmm. on the morrow, we prepare once more to sail. The king was saying, fill our casks anew with spring water. Take every sack of grain and cask of beef and as many ship and goats as we can carry. The wounded who are still hale enough to pull an oar will row. The rest shall remain here to help hold these isles for their new lords. Torwald and the red oarsmen will soon be back with more provisions. Our decks will stink of pigs and chickens on the voyage east. But we'll return with dragons. When? The voice was Lord Roderick's. When shall we return, your grace? A year? Three years? Five? Your dragons are a world away, and autumn is upon us. The reader walked forward, sounding all the hazards. Galleys guard the red wine straits. The Dornish coast is dry and bleak. Four hundred leagues of whirlpools, cliffs, and hidden shoals with hardly a safe landing anywhere. <clears throat> Beyond wait the stepstones with their storms and their nests of lies seen in mirish pirates. If a thousand ships set sail, three hundred may reach the far side of the narrow sea. And then what? Lys will not welcome us, nor will Volantis. Where will you find fresh water, food? The first storm will scatter us across half the earth. A smile played across Euron's blue lips. I am the storm, my lord. You can't comment on that. You're not allowed. The first storm and the last. <laughs> I have taken the silence on longer voyages than this. And one far more hazardous. Have you forgotten? I have sailed the smoking sea and seen Valyria. Every man knew the doom still ruled Valyria. The very sea there boiled and smoked. Okay, Tim. Fine. Yeah. You- my points make themselves all like right. All all my theories that I've been that I've been you know force it into here now they're all lining up <laughs> well yeah we, we knew this line was coming yeah he is the storm and that's it's almost like saying i'm the devil in the context of ironborn culture so it's it's quite the thing to say hmm. every man knew the doom still ruled valeria the very seaboard smoked the land was overrun with demons it was said that any sailor who so much glimpsed the fiery mountains of valeria rising by the waves would soon die a dreadful death yet the crow's eye had been there and returned have you? The reader asked, so softly. Euron's blue smile vanished. Reader, he said into the quiet, you would do well to keep your nose in your books. Victorian could feel the unease in the hall. He pushed himself to his feet. Brother, he boomed, you have not answered Harlaw's questions. Euron shrugged. The price of slaves is rising. We will sell our slaves in Lys and Volantis. That and the plunder we have taken there, taken here, will give us sufficient gold to buy provisions. Are we slavers now? asked the reader. And for what? Dragons that no man here has seen. Shall we chase some drunken sailor's fancy to the far ends of the earth? His words drew mutters of assent. Slaver's Bay is too far, called out Ralph the Limper. And too close to Valeria, shouted Kellen Humble. Freyleg the Strong said, High Garden's close. I say look for dragons there, the golden kind. Alvin Sharp said, Why sail the world when the mander lies before us? Red Ralph Stonehouse bounded to his feet. Old Town is richer, and the arbor richer still. Redwine's fleet. Uh, what was it? Is so is off away. We need only reach out our hand to pluck the ripest fruit in Westeros. 
Fruit? The king's eye looked more black than blue. Only a craven would steal a fruit when he could take the orchard. It is the arbor we want, said Red Ralph, and the other man took up the cry. The crow's eye let the shouts wash over him. Then he leapt down from the table, grabbed his slattern by the arm, and pulled her from the hall. Go ahead, Tim. Fled like a dog. Euron's hold upon the sea stone chair suddenly did not seem as secure as it had a few moments before. They will not follow him to Slaver's Bay. Perhaps they are not such dogs and fools as I had feared. That was such a merry thought that Victorian had to wash it down. He drained a cup with the barber to show him that he did not begrudge him his lordship, even if it came from Euron's hand. Out I like that, you know, we're still friends. Outside the sun went down, darkness gathered beyond the walls, but inside the torches burned with a ruddy orange glow, and their smoke gathered upon the rafters like a gray cloud. Drunken men began to dance the finger dance. At some point, left-hand Lucas Cod decided he wanted one of Lord Hewitt's daughters, so he took her on a table whilst her sister screamed and sobbed. Okay, and now we're getting less fun. Uh, Victorian felt a tap upon his shoulder. One of Euron's mongrel sons stood behind him, a boy of ten with woolly hair and skin the color of mud. My father wishes words with you. Victorian rose unsteadily. He was a big man with large capacity for wine, and even so, he had drunk too much. I beat her to death with my own hands, he thought, but the crow's eye killed her when he shoved himself inside her. I had no choice. So yeah, again, this is more of this, like, uh, I guess we would say toxic masculinity among the Ironborn, the honor killing. The fact that uh, your Victorian's reputation is more important to him, the fact that he feels men would laugh at him, that's more important than this, this woman's life. Uh, he followed the bastard boy from the hall and up a winding stone stair. The sounds of rape and revelry diminished as they climbed until there was only the soft scrape of boots on stone. The crow's eye had taken Lord Hewitt's bedchamber along with his bastard daughter. When he entered, the girl was sprawled naked on the bed, snoring softly. Euron stood by the window, drinking from a silver cup. He wore the sable cloak he took from Black Tide, his red leather eye patch, and nothing else. Okay, so red leather eye patch. So his eye, his blood eye being covered, it literally is a red eye right now, a red star eye. And it's when sometimes I was, black, pat, the patch is sometimes black and sometimes red. So he's got a couple, you know. Yeah. Um, also, the description is just hilarious. It's like wearing a cloak and socks and that's all. You know, like, it's yeah, very yeah. much like from like a, a trashy romance novel almost. You know, his red leather eye patch yeah. and nothing else. So he wore... Uh, and when I was a boy, I dreamt that I could fly, he announced. When I woke, I couldn't, or so the maester said. But what if he lied? Victorian could smell the sea through the open window, though the room stank of wine and blood and sex. The cold air helped to clear his head. What do you mean? Let's let's go back to this this famous line about you're on flying here. I just noticed that. Not only is it similar to Bran's flying in his dream, he says, when I woke, the maester said I couldn't. When Bran wakes, the maester Lewin. is also poo-pooing what he has to say about dreams and weirwoods and tree thoughts and children of the forest and all that shit, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is more of Euron, possibly a failed dreamer, uh, if he was contacted in his dreams by Bloodraven, but again, like, a connection was severed, be it Blood Raven severing it or just lack of weirwoods on the Iron Islands. But the point is, is that Euron caught a glimpse of it and he's never stopped chasing what he saw. And at least in my idea, my theory, my idea for his endgame is he's going to chase it to the ends of the earth until he finally gets what he wants. And it's just going to it's going to blow up right in his face. Uh, yes, uh, I, I it would. You, it, it always does for the characters who, you know, are hubristic in this story. So, what do you mean, Victorian says, about flying and all this crap? Euron turned to face him, his bruised blue lips curled into a half-smile. Literally, this is the picture, this is the moment. Perhaps we can fly, all of us. How will we ever know unless we leap from some tall tower? The wind came gusting through the window and stirred his sable cloak. There was something obscene 
and disturbing about his nakedness. No man ever truly knows what he can do unless he dares to leap. There's the window. Leap. Victorian had no patience for this. His wounded hand was troubling him. What do you want? The world. Firelight glimmered in Johan's eye, his smiling eye. Will you take a cup of Lord Hewitt's wine? There's no wine half so sweet as wine taken from a beaten foe. No, Victorian glanced away. Cover yourself. Euron seated himself and gave his cloak a twitch, so it covered his private parts. I had forgotten what a small and noisy folk they are, my ironborn. I would bring them dragons, and they shout out for grapes. Grapes are real. A man can gorge himself on grapes. Their juice is sweet, and they make wine. What do dragons make? Whoa. The crows, this your eyes like, ah, oh, they make woe and destruction. <laughs> the crow's eye sipped from his silver cup. I once held a dragon's egg in this hand, brother. The merest wizard swore he could hatch it if I gave him a year and all the gold he required. When I grew bored with his excuses, I slew him. As he watched his entrails sliding through his fingers, he said, But it has not been a year. He laughed. Craghorns died, did you know? Just a little tra smooth transition. <laughs> Craghorn's dead, did you know? Who? The man who blew my dragon horn. When the maester cut him open, his lungs were charred as black as soot. Victorian shuddered. Show me this dragon's egg. I threw it in the sea during one of my dark moods. So, when the moon turned dark, Euron being a moon character, when the moon was in a dark mood, it threw a dragon's egg into the sea. That's more sea dragon. A dragon's egg is a piece of stone. The, dra the moon was like an egg and cracked and gave birth to dragons. So, the meteors are very much like dragon eggs. So, it was thrown into the sea when the moon was in a black mood. So that's, that's more long night stuff. Euron gave a shrug. It comes to me that the reader was not wrong. Too large a fleet could never hold together over such a distance. The voyage is too long, too perilous. Only our finest ships and crews could hope to sail to Slaver's Bay and back. <laughs> oh, it's so hard. Nobody could do it except for, well, maybe the very toughest ironborn. Maybe, I don't know if anybody like that is in the room or anything. The, the, child, the psychology here is just great. The iron fleet is mine, Victorian thought. He said nothing. The crow's eye filled two cups with a strange black wine that flowed as thick as honey. Drink with me, brother. Have a taste of this. He offered one of the cups to Victorian. The captain took the cup Euron had not offered, sniffed at its contents suspiciously. Seen up close, it looked more blue than black. It was thick and oily, with a smell like rotted flesh. He tried a small swallow and spit it out at once. Foul stuff. Do you mean to poison me? I mean to open your eyes. Euron drank deep from his own cup and smiled. Shade of the evening, the wine of the warlocks. I came upon a cask of it when I captured a certain gallius out of Carth, along with some cloves and nutmeg, forty bolts of green silk, and four warlocks who told a curious tale. One presumed to threaten me, so I killed him, and fed him to the other three. <laughs> they refused to eat of their friend's flesh at first, but when they grew hungry enough, they had a change of heart. Men are meat. Balin was mad. Aaron is madder, and Euron is maddest of them all. Victorian was turning to go when the crow's eye said, A king must have a wife to give him heirs. Brother, I have need of you. Will you go to Slaver's Bay and bring my love to me? I had a love once, too. Victorian's hands coiled into fists, and a drop of blood fell to patter on the floor. I should have beat you raw and red and fed you to the crabs, the same as I did her. You have sons, he told his brother. Base-born mongrels, born of whores and weepers. They are of your body. So are the contents of my chamber pot. That's my favorite year online. None is fit to sit the sea stone chair, much less the iron throne. No. To make an heir that's worthy of him, I need a different woman. When the kraken weds the dragon, brother, let all the world beware. Go ahead. 
good pick. I've, I've had too much fun reading here. Sorry. Okay. So there's a couple things I want to point out there. So, uh, so Victorian spits out the shade of the evening, whereas uh, Aaron uh, is forced to drink it by Euron. And we got to remember, we had talked about Victorian's kind of, you know, bit, bit more simple. He does symbolism and metaphor, not his forte. So here is a drink that's meant to open your third eye, expand your mind. And Victorian, the simple one, refuses to drink it. So I think that's just great. The fact that he spits it out and doesn't swallow. So his mind is never opened. That's just like a great thing. That's what keeps Victorian staying Victorian until he comes across Makoro. Um, let's I see. I thought you were going to uh, make some that, Yeah, he, re he re basically refers to his own sons as shit. Again, like just showing complete lack of empathy, uh, no no care. Like even bat like his, his children mean nothing to them. So nothing listen, to him at all. I yeah. hate to tell you this, but since we're two and a half hours into this stream two hours and 50 minutes i will tell you that there is a line of symbolism i have not touched because it is so shitty um and it is the shit symbolism the others are like poos apparently um they come out the back door of the weirwood yggdrasil has a backside <laughs> that's muddy there's this whole thing craster's craster's keep is like on a hill that's made of mud and craster's shit Dollar said says, um, there's this thing about armor, uh, honor and the shitty honor of the king's guard and the whitewashing of shitty honor. Um, it's like I said, it's like it is there. I, I teased Ravenous Reader for years about it. I was like, you're insane. I'm never using this on the podcast, and I probably never will. No, um, uh, but I, she, I, so she, she loves to bring it up, but that's what this is. You're on as a knight's king has all these mongrel children and they are like his, the contents of his chamber pot. Uh, so that's, that's Craster's sons that are given to the others. Um, okay. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> no, no. Hi, hey, hi, highbrow poop jokes, highbrow dick jokes. They're, they're both a thing. And that's, that's an example of it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Rebecca Weston, you're a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you're a problem lower your caps lock ma'am sir <laughs> milady whichever i'm not sure uh she's got a sword that's for sure okay all right <laughs> i'm just playing all right so let's uh finish up this we're almost here at the end i uh, go ahead yeah uh, so are the contents but none is fit to sit okay so what when the Kraken weds the dragon brother, let all the world beware. Okay, that's the other one I want to point out. Um, because going back to the Lovecraft stuff, the Cthulhu and Hastor imagery, um, they are uh, Krakens. They are, when they when we give a physical description of both of them, they are Kraken, dragon, and human. So if Euron were to actually succeed in this plan of his, if he were to ever actually father a child with Danny, symbolically that would be a human who is kraken and dragon so it's it's just more uh elder god uh cthulhu lovecraft imagery this son of krakens and dragons um Sounds but moving bad. on yeah yeah uh what dragons okay that's the line She's yeah what dragon third. Yeah. What dragon said Victorian frowning the last of her line. They say she is the fairest woman in the world. Her hair is silver gold and her eyes are amethyst. So that's amethyst empress. Uh, but you need. And so, yeah, that's tying Danny to the amethyst empress, which then ties Euron back to the bloodstone emperor. Uh, but you need not take my word for it, brother. Go to Slaver's Bay. Be behold her beauty and bring her back to me. Why should I? Victorian demanded for love, for duty, because your king commands it, you're on chuckled, and for the sea stone chair, it is yours once I claim the iron throne. You shall follow me as I followed Balin, and your own true-born sons shall one day follow you, my own sons. But to have a true-born son, a man must first have a wife. Victorian had no luck with wives. Euron's gifts are poisoned, he reminded himself, but still. The choice is yours, brother. Live a thrall or die a king. Do you dare to fly? Unless you take the leap, 
you'll never know. Your on smiling eye was bright with mockery. Or do I ask too much of you? It is a fearsome thing to sail beyond Valyria. I could sail the Iron Fleet to hell if need be. Uh, <laughs> so when Victarion opened his hand, his palm was red with blood. I'll go to Slaver's Bay. I, I'll find this dragon woman and I'll bring her back. But not for you. You stole my wife and despoiled her. So I'll have yours, the fairest woman in the world, for me. All right, so um, real quick, yeah. I could sail the Iron Fleet to hell if need be. So that's kind of like Euron, um, I mean, Victarion uh, sailing the river Styx, if we want to like tie that into Greek myth. Yeah, and of course, um, you know, it, that's also one way to look at this whole idea of Azor or and Nissa going into the Weirwood Net. Mm -hmm. They're going into the death realm. Um, so yeah. sailing and to hell and back. I mean, we've seen so many, like, I mean, that song about Renly's ride. He was killed and then asked the Lord of Death for one more chance. So he came back and defeated Stannis, you know, or whatever. That's the song yeah. that they told. So it's like, yeah, there's all of these people that are undead or resurrected are coming back from hell or going to hell and back. Patch Face talks about leading in. You know, I'll lead us into the sea and back out again. You know, mm -hmm. same idea. So, pretty. And cool. there are there are rivers in the Weirwood Net. That would be the river that runs underneath Blood Raven's cave, which is probably how Bran and Mira are going to get out. Yeah, I, I increasingly think that that's the case. Um, and then also the reverse psychology angle again. So it finally works. He's like, Oh, unless I've asked something that's too hard. He's like, Oh no, I can do anything. He's like sold. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And then of course, <laughs> Vic in his mind is justifying it by imagining that he will do this. And of course, Euron expects that. So that's where we are folks. That is the chapter. So last call for questions. Tim, last observations. Um, let me turn my gears too, and I'll think if there's anything that I haven't mentioned. Uh, okay, so at the beginning of the stream, I did mention uh, more uh, with the Pleiades and the Hyades, which was Atlas. And I think that's that can where this can come in now. Um, so the story of Atlas. Atlas is a Titan who uh, he is condemned by Zeus to hold the sky and heavens above his shoulders. And that is because that is his punishment for his war against the gods. Um, Atlas, uh, the Zeus and the Olympian gods are not the first pantheon. They get that, they get that rank by warring against their father, Cronus, the Titan and the other Titans. And Titus is like a leader among them. So Titus, I mean, Atlas leads a war against the gods, which is exactly what Euron is trying to do, a war against the gods. But uh, among them uh, are also his brothers, Prometheus and Epimetheus. They are Atlas's brothers, so they are titans, but they fight on the side of the gods. So here we have this titan waging war against the gods, but also warring against his own brothers. So Atlas is like a Euron stand-in. And then what comes as a result? Well... He doesn't win the war, just as Euron's more than likely not going to actually become a god at the end of this. And instead, he is he is punished by the gods, weighed it down, hold the earth and the, hold the stars and the heavens above your shoulders. And I've put a lot of thought into, well, okay, well, how does that play into Euron's story? And I, I, and I come up with an idea. Your and eye on Rand. I'm sorry? Your eye on Rand. The Ion, <laughs> Ion Islands, um, Ion Rand Islands. So Atlas. Oh, that's Atlas Shrugged. That's different. That's I'm Atlas sorry. Shrugged. That's not yeah. mythology. Well, uh, kind of is. Uh, it's conservative yeah. mythology. But go ahead. No. And and Rand died on welfare. We don't talk about her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that which is uh, that's the name of a punk band. I'd like to have one day. Um, anyway. So oh, great Atlas. way, Tim. Coming with the hits. I love you this much more right now. Go ahead, Tim. So, uh, going back to Atlas, okay, so I've thought about this and how this can play into Euron's story, and the, the idea I've had is, um, when we get to all these Lovecraft stuff, and I've said, like, the running theme in Lovecraft is you open the chaos door, you see something you weren't supposed to see, you get mind melted. 
And I think the same is going to happen to Euron. When we think of Euron as this like plan B Knights King uh, after John is, is wrestled back from the others. Um, and so Euron, Euron becomes the second Knights King, but I don't think, I think it's going to be Euron's body doing the actions but it's not going to be Euron at the helm. His conscience, like Euron's going to be otherized. He's essentially what's going to happen is Euron is going to be skin changed by the others. And what happens when a person is skin changed by another? It's we see what happens with Hodor. Their mind is pushed back, so they are uh, they become they are dominated. Mm -hmm. So we relate this back to Euron. What is Euron's thing? He dominates his brothers. Um, he physically and sexually abused abused Aaron and Yuri. He psychologically abuses uh, Victorian. So what would be like the perfect karmic retribution? It would be for Euron to be dominated in this way. Essentially, you know, for lack of a better word, mind raped by, by a force greater than him. Um, I do think, like, back to the question when someone said, do they think John is going to take Euron's Valyrian steel armor? I think he's actually going to hold on to it in his role as Night's King, because it's going to be like um, an other, an icy zombie wearing a fire armor. It'd be like the wall wearing the mm -hmm. five she wearing the five port the, the five forts as armor. It, it just how John is symbolically the song of ice and fire by being Stark and Targaryen. This mm -hmm. would be Euron. Uh, in his own ice and fire with the, the icy Knights King wearing the fire armor. Yeah, I totally but agree. Again, and also the, the black dragon is a symbol of night, just like the lion of night is all the black yeah. dragon, like characters eventually become night King characters. The black yeah. dragons and are the meteors. So he's basically dressing up like a moon meteor, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to put it yeah, that but way. If so if Euron is like otherized in this way, where he becomes this Knight's King, but he's not really in control, rather um, his consciousness is pushed to the back, then that's going to be like he's being weighted down by this divine, by this higher divine force that he unleashes the way Atlas is weighted down by the stars in the heavens. And that's what I see like just, again, you weave perfectly weaving Lovecraftian, uh, Lovecraftian lore with actual mythology. Uh, and just forming it together. And I think, like I said, and the mind melt of Euron to be dominated by a force greater than him, a godly force in a way, uh, it just seems like perfect karma, karmic retribution. That's where I see uh, Euron's story going. I wonder, since we're not in Euron's POV, that's mm -hmm. the fun part, is we're going to be left guessing who yeah. is in control up there. <laughs> so we'll have to and see that's... if we can see a, a change in Euron's behavior or appearance. And that's what makes Victorian's change in perspective so important. So, like, Victorian is like the building blocks to what could possibly happen to Euron. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. With the fire hand and whatnot. I also have an idea of what might actually, because of this stuff, these noting these stand, these object stand-ins that your that George tends to do. I think I have an idea of what might lay at the heart of winter. And it goes back to um, your last stream about uh, fake mats being burned in the Weirwood cage. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I I don't know exactly what the object George is going to use is, whatever lays at the heart of winter. I believe it's going to be made, it's going to be some form of oily black stone or something made from Weirwood, perhaps actually a Weirwood cage. But I think I know what Lovecraft object he's going to be uh building it from i see and that and that is the black sarcophagus of nephrin ka so okay um, what this is you had just, me a black just, sarcophagus go ahead <laughs> okay so what this is is that okay so i said uh lovecraft and his writer friends would just straight up take people places and things from each other's story just you know they borrowed them with permission so the black stone this trapezohedron um, when it first comes to Earth, it starts off in Atlantis and it leads to the downfall of Atlantis. It later makes its way into Robert E. Howard of Conan in the Tales of Cull, where it is in possession of the Serpent Men of Volusia. Volusia, Valeria, Serpent Men. So you, again, uh, I need to read more Conan books so I can do more Robert Howard stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it, 
Then it finds its way back into Lovecraft stories in ancient Egypt, uh, where it is in the possession of the Pharaoh Nefren Ka, and he worships, worships it like a god. Okay, so Pharaoh, god king, worshiping a black stone. Boy, doesn't this one sound familiar, right? Yeah. And then, yeah, and then Nefren Ka, um, he lives uh, not in a like he lives a long time, like not absurdly long, but longer than most people would live in that time. He is embalmed and he's entombed and buried in this black sarcophagus. And like pharaohs, he's buried with all of his riches, including this trapezohedron. And that's where it stays until the 1800s when it's all unearthed by who else but the British. And that's how the trapezohedron and the black sarcophagus make their way back out into the world. Um, and it is from this point that Nyarlathotep, the, the god who, the god of chaos who is summoned by this stone, um, when he takes a human form, it's always in the form of this black pharaoh. Now, I relate this back to Euron because there have been some theories that that c compare Euron to a Nyarlathotep type. But I say no, because I, uh, I think Nyarlathotep is a better comparison to the others because Euron's on a level but he's not on that big of a level. There's like a hierarchy in Lovecraft. You got Cthulhu and Hastur who are elder gods, but then there's other higher ones like the outer gods, like Nyarlathotep and Azathoth, who are even more of a, just a more of an exist this higher existential threat, just like the others are a step above Euron. So I think that, that this leads to another thing of why I believe that Euron's going to be mind melted by something greater than him. Because even though he's trying to become a god, he's maybe he'll get to this level of god king. But the level of actual god is always going to be something that's unattainable for him. There's always going to be, you know, always a bigger fish. Well, yeah, he's got to completely leave behind humanity. So that's like, yeah. who are you at that point? Um, mm -hmm. so at the center of the heart of winter, yeah, those are the two things I've always said is oily stone and a frozen weirwood, the frozen weirwood I'm quite certain of just because of the eerie and all the symbolism that consistently shows us weirwood objects, um, mm -hmm. that weirwood table, you know, in the Lord commander's chamber, it's consistently inside the, uh, ice temple places we find the weir frozen weirwood. But there's also that dragon locked in ice pattern where there's always a piece of the fire moon inside the ice moon, a piece of one inside the other. Um, you know, Jon Snow is a dragon who grows up in the north in Winterfell. Uh, Night's King was a dragon who got frozen and gave his seed and soul to Night's Queen and made the others as his king's guard. So yeah. there should be a black dragon object in the heart of winter as well. So when you talk about black sarcophagus, well, the weirwoods are sarcophaguses. They yeah. are, we've said Night's King spirit is going to be in the weirwood net, but yeah, there could be black stone involved too. Yeah. So I, and so honestly, I think, when the show yeah. gave us those stone obelisks around the weirwood tree, I was kind of mm -hmm. wondering if maybe they didn't make that up on their own, but no. Nah, so like I said, I think whatever object George plans to use, whatever it is, I think it's going to act like the black sarcophagus does this thing that seals this God King who worshiped the black stone. And then to open it to like, to open the sarcophagus is to release that, that the bloodstone emperor to release a evil ace or ace. I, I mean, evil ace or a high, I'm sorry, too excited uh, to release it back out in the world. And if you do, it's going to need a vessel. And that's where I see Euron coming in. Right, and just as Azor High is in the weirwood net, like there should be a poisonous object in the heart of winter, and it should be a black stone. It really should be. Um, and in fact, I don't. I kind of wonder if maybe the whole other's ability to raise the dead has something to do with some Ashai stone being there mm -hmm. in the heart of winter. But we'll see. It's pretty speculative. My brain's cooked. Oh. It's been three hours. So thanks everybody. Yeah. Thanks Tim. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to go take a nap. So I love you guys. <laughs> and um, I've got a video coming out probably tomorrow morning unless I decide to hold it for Tuesday. It's done. But it is. Well, I'm not even going to say what it is. But I've got produced videos coming back to the channel starting this week. So make sure you're looking out tomorrow for a video. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Make sure you're subscribed to Grey Waste Tim whose channel is linked in the description below a couple of different times. Yes. So 
Or you can just yes, type in Grey Waste Tim. My next planned stream is looking at Cathilla and Asha. Uh, one of the stories that I want to read, it's a real short story called In the Hall of the Yellow King. Uh, and that is a story that has um, the black sarcophagus, Cathilla, who is the Kraken's daughter, just as Asha is the Kraken's daughter, uh, and Niarla Hotep as characters that appear in it. Cool. Well, let me know when it is, and I'll make sure that I won't miss it. Mm -hmm. Did you just say when it is, or you're not sure yet? I'm not sure. I gotta. Okay. Um, I gotta find. I, I work a lot. I work. Too I just much. want to make sure I didn't miss it. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Yeah, no, no plan date, but I got. I, I know exactly what I want to do with it when it happens. Well, I'll let everybody know. So, of course, follow me on social media, David Lightbringer. I will share Tim stuff, and uh, follow, that's it. I will see you, you guys. Follow, oh, sorry, Tim. What'd you say? Oh, and they can. You can follow me. Oh, yeah. On Twitter. That'd be a good idea. Wave. Yeah, follow you. <laughs> Yeah, because I'll, I'll post links on my Twitter. <laughs> so on on Twitter, you are um, the Gray Waste. Yeah, and then uh, and that YouTube. and YouTube. Okay, the Gray and Waste. YouTube is Gray Waste Tim. There you go. Gray Waste the. All right, thanks for coming on Gray Waste the. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so I'm so toasted right now. I was I did not get. I stayed up till about six or seven in the morning working on that video. Um, it, so. It, it's fine. I, I had plenty to say, so you could have you could have praised Garth all night. <laughs> I pretty much did. Um, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I will. Uh, thanks for coming on, as always, Tim. I'll probably. I guess I'll. I don't know. We'll have to see. I do want to get through the whole. Uh, you're on reread. I might take a break next week from it, though. So we'll see what we're doing okay. next week. But there will be. We're we're doing regular Sunday streams now. Every Sunday at three. So this is where to find us. And uh, that's it. Cheers, guys. Take care. See you soon. Good night.